Um, let, let's quickly go back here. We got to go back to this game between uh, Jojua and Tarantula One because somehow it's become a game of mutual time pressure. Oh my God, is this really happening? How did Jojua blow this? What? I gotta okay. go back to the game too. I, I, maybe King E4 just blew it. He's threatening Knight D3, but not really, because on King C3 there is no E2. I think he missed that, because the Knight hangs with check. He just missed that. As soon as he played it, I could tell that he just like forgot that. Uh, and now, now Joshua should still be winning. He can take G4. Okay, King D4, take E3, and and he. One second for black. Oh, he's got a flag. What? Zero point oh, eight flag. second. You scared me. God, don't yell at me like that. I... I'm sorry. I was, no, I was getting okay. a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. And there was resignation with point two. Now I'm yelling. And it's Pro Chess League Day. We like to, to, to say around here, show day is show day. That's what it means when we're focused on a show and, and not the other things at chess.com. But she doesn't need a reminder to be focused. International Master Anna Rudolph is with me here. No matter where she is in the world, she does Pro Chess League <laughs> commentary. So you're still in Chile, but you're excited I'm to be here. I'm still in Chile. Welcome, everyone, and happy Valentine's Day. What a better way to spend your Valentine's Day than by watching chess.com streams on Twitch the whole day. I think that's a great plan. What else can you do on Valentine's uh, exa Day? I mean, I would say chess is love, and I know I'm spending my Valentine's Day here with some chess and then tonight um, driving to the airport to pick up a co-worker. So not, not, not anything but chess.com <laughs> for this guy on Valentine's Day either, but uh, hope that hope that you have exciting plans here, although... It doesn't get more exciting than chess. Let's talk about the Eastern yeah. Division. This is week six, that is. We have reached already the halfway mark at the Pro Chess League. And I would highlight that we have three top teams, the yep. Tbilisi Gentlemen, the Armenia Eagles, and the Mumbai Movers. They are the top three teams. And then there's a bigger gap between the third and fourth place, thanks to the victory of the Mumbai Movers against the Delhi Dynamites last week. And that was due to their first board, Adiban, scoring four out of four on the top board, beating his teammate and friend, Hare Krishna. I think this Indian Derby was really crucial yep. for the movers. And now we shall see if the Dynamites can keep the fourth place because there are three teams, the Moscow Wizards, the Moscow Phoenix and the Volga Stormbringers that would like to make it to the playoffs. 
No, you, you just summarized it very well, and I think one of the most interesting storylines of the Eastern Division is, has been also the team we didn't mention there, sitting right at the top, the Tbilisi Gentlemen, with 122 points overall. What, what should be noted is if you look across all four divisions here, everybody, the Webster Windmills and the Xiangdu Pandas have already played their Week 6 matches, and they reached, yeah. respectively, 112 and 118 points. The Tbilisi Gentlemen have 122, and they haven't even played Week 6 yet. So if you're if you're wondering why they've been a storyline all year in terms of their dominance of the Eastern Division, that should help explain it right there. They've got more points than any of the top teams from any division, and they're 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 a uh, they're a whole match behind the Atlantic and the Pacific right now. So um, that's that's definitely going to be something that if if it continues to be that way in the East, it'll be everybody else is fighting for second place, and the Tbilisi gentlemen are the clear favorite. But uh, the the other thing we can remind you about, of course, we are about to go live with all these games as they are, actually, I believe the first one just started, but right below on and I, you can see we're reminding you of all the interesting ways you can follow the Pro Chess League content. The highlights show between Levy Rosman and Bigfoot was just shown, YouTube videos from mm -hmm. David Pruis. Those are our prizes, and uh, as as you're looking for other ways to get involved with the Pro Chess League, those are all the different social portals you can follow us on. So our pregame mentions are underway, and now it's time for the X's and O's on the chessboard. We have, uh, well, we have, let's see, right now we have Ivlev versus Gupta as one of the yeah. one of the big games that have just gotten started. Yeah, that is the Delhi Dynamites versus the Volga Stormbringers. Mm -hmm. Today we will see the two Indian uh, teams facing two Russian teams. So Delhi Dynamites versus Volga Stormbringers and later on the Mumbai Movers against the Moscow Wizards. I'm curious to see if India or Russia will score better today. Yeah. This is the top board Abhijit Gupta with the black pieces against board four of the Stormbringers. This is those rounds where you expect the top board to, to get a win, but also where sometimes the storyline of the matches is, is sort of being foreshadowed here when you if you see board fours sometimes get a draw or even a victory over a top board that's usually a good sign for their team um other other games underway here between the Stormbringers and the dynamite uh let's mention we've got uh Briakin versus indian lad mm -hmm. that's uh seems to be a bit of a theme here one d4 we've also got sahaj grover versus frolianov Mm -hmm. This is a an interesting one as well. A, a Petrov here, Sahaj Grover versus Fraliyanov. That'll be that'll be something we come back to. And the last one we haven't mentioned, just to make sure you're aware of all four boards in case you want to go to chess.com and follow the games yourself. Um, we have Opari and Grigori taking on Manu David, Manu David Sathranjram, full name, and uh, and that's it. So where you want it, where you want to go here on the X's and O's of this of this first part of the program. Any game, any game caught your eye? Um, I think so far the one I see the most instructive, and I would like to ask your opinion about it, is the one between Briakin and Indian Lad. Indian Lad okay. being uh, Master Narayanan. Okay. How do you see this bone structure, Danny? And uh, what what shall be the it, insight to this middle game? Well, thank you for asking. As if I know a lot about the Catalan, but I will <laughs> I will do my best to to pretend. I will I will say that the uh, the opening here. The Catalan, Catalan, however you want to call it. Um, this is so. This is the typical thing that happens in this structure, where at some point, with White putting the bishop on g2, with the idea of bringing pressure on the long diagonal, Black has a choice to either over support things with things like c6, like a closed, a closed Catalan, or to take on c4 and try to punish White for not having the bishop on its natural diagonal here to go and collect the pawn. And so what ends up happening is White loses time recollecting the pawn with the queen. And, uh, and Black hopefully uses that to accelerate the queen side. But I look at this position, and I guess strategically I always have a preference to white, not just because Kromnik is one of my favorite players of all time, but because I always look at the position and I convince myself Black isn't going to get c5 to free the bishop on b7, and that mm -hmm. means that white's just going to be positionally better with the rook coming to c1, maybe the knight comes from d2 to b3. But that's the storyline, is, is will Black get a move like c5, right? We just saw this move rook to c8. Black is going to go out of his way to make sure he can punch this move through and not be left with kind of a bad bishop on b7 and a backward pawn on c6. So that's the, thank you for asking, that's my description of what the philosophical debate is in this position in terms of what both white and black are trying to do. But do you play this position for either side? 
I do. I do play it as black and you, per you perfectly describe it. So I have nothing to add but to see whether black can push C5 because that is the liberating move. As Danny said, that's the move that black is aiming for because it would free the B7 bishop. If black cannot get C5 uh, played in the right moment, then he's going to get into trouble. It's more space for white and better piece placement. And so what are your, so here we go, C5. we've got C5, so now that it's played, what are the drawbacks or what are the dangers to be aware of tactically if we're providing instruction for the viewers, maybe play this position as white or black or not, what, what's, what's going to happen now? Obviously there's tension between the C and the D pawn, um, but black has achieved uh, the first goal of the position, which is to open up the bishop on the long diagonal. Yes, and black is threatening to win a pawn because c takes d4 would open the c file, attacking the queen that's discovered attack. Um, Black should be always careful when he pushes c5, what's going to happen to the b5 pawn. So at the moment, it's it's an undefended piece, but I don't mm -hmm. see any tactics that could make it work. And also, the d file will open up after the trade on c5, and the queen on, is on d8 for the moment, but the rook hasn't made it to d1. So I think Black right. actually found the perfect moment to break through yeah. with c5. No, I mean, obviously, it's going to be easy for us to start to favor black now we know that uh black is the favorite in the in the matchup obviously this is the board one for uh for the dynamite versus or at least the board two i need to check the pairings i have the pairings right here but at board one or board two obviously against uh yeah the board two of the dynamites facing yep. board three of the Stormbringers. so so he's supposed to be the favorite and kind of right now seems to know the opening a little bit better but let's go to a board where the favorite is supposed to be uh, the person playing for the Stormbringers. That is Oparian Grigori, taken mm -hmm. on Manu David. Because this one, this one's heating up here with this interesting stonewall structure that didn't start this way. But now with Black committing F5, Anna, your thoughts on whether Black is really going to be able to justify F5 with some sort of kingside attack? Or is it really just to overprotect the knight on E4 and, and make sure that Black doesn't lose his grip on the light squares? I think it's good for both. I'm curious to see whether he's actually aiming for some aggressive kingside pawn pushes like g5, g4, or simply to to make sure that this knight is well placed on e4. And if white takes on e4, uh, the, back, the black pawn will take back the f5 pawn, I believe, so that you can open up the f5 for the rooks. Mm -hmm. I like this position for black because uh, he's got a good grip in the center. And the potential of pushing g5, g4, even if it's not my kind of style. Here, there's almost a 600 rating point difference with, between the players. And I think that means that we're going to see an aggressive approach by Oparin. Yeah, exactly, right? I mean, just because it is a team event, and we talk about that angle a lot, right? You've got a situation where the uh, you got to win for your team when you're the much higher rated player, even if sometimes the chess isn't, isn't saying that you should win a position. But I think in this case, Grigori's going to be right at home with an attack on the king side. I think you summarized it really well. Obviously, we highlighted you can't take on e4 just to show everybody taking with the knight would allow an obvious, an obvious fork emote, our first fork emote of the day, fork. right? You don't want to do that. Uh, but even, even taking with the bishop, <laughs> even taking with the bishop less than ideal, as Anna highlighted, because of the f file quickly becoming uh, under, under Black's ownership. So. I kind of like Black's chances here. Yes, yes, you're slightly favoring the nearly 2,700 feet a player. At least he was at one point. Um, and uh, I like what you said about G5. And one of the things I want to highlight, the reason that's possible for some of our members who are like, hey, like, how come they can just open their king and I get told by my chess coach not to open my king? In this situation, the center is completely closed, which means that... It's just not easy for someone to bring the ki the kitchen sink against your king. There's no open bishop here on the dark square diagonal. The queen and bishop here are also sort of blocked up. So you can get away with things like this and really be aggressive in a situation where you feel like you can dictate the center and keep it closed. So, um, all right, we'll, we'll keep our eye on this one. This one end up this could be something we have to watch on it because if a Grigori gets the attack we're thinking, this could be some fireworks and we don't want to miss that. Definitely. But let's move on to game let's have a look at the the grover for yanov position okay. for a moment because it's uh, uh there has been lots of peace trades already this was a yep. patch of defense i felt like we are watching uh, Cos and caruana but it wasn't yep. it is the pro chess league not not carls and caruana you're right but this is almost close to one of the games they played in the world chess championship for those of you who Missed it. They did. They did end up playing a couple Petrovs, and there was one line that quickly went into a position like this, almost with similar type of tactics, right? Where you started to calculate: yeah. Does White have opportunities to 
uh, to go pawn grabbing. Right now, h7 is hanging with check, right? So let's let's go over some of these tactics for the fans. If bishop takes h7 with check, uh, there's actually two options. You could have put the king on h8 or f8, because h8 is possible given that taking f7 would actually lose the bishop. And what ends up what it, what would have ended up happening to white is now the knight has to guard the bishop, but this mm -hmm. bishop that's guarding the knight is under fire by the knight on d5, and so white is sort of overwhelmed with the tactical issues, which is why um, ultimately we see that uh, Grover didn't do anything with that. He just backed up the knight and said, "You know what? Enough's enough. I'm not even going to try to win a pawn." So, um, but now we're getting you. You mentioned it, Anna. You're right. This is this is Carlson Caruana in the sense that. Black has no issues here, and if anything, Black may be the one playing for an edge with the bishop pair in the end game. Yes, it's even better than the Carson Caruana game because uh, for now, Black has managed to keep his pair of bishops. It's not an opposite color bishop end game as in the World Championship match. So I'm curious if uh, Florian will manage to get the better of Grover. They are very, very close in rating. So the two players, Grandmasters, 2,500. Therefore, this is a very equal a match in terms of their strength, their normal mm -hmm. strength, but in a game anything can happen. And I like Black's position a lot. I, I'm a fan of the pair of bishops. Yeah, me too. Right? We have that in common a lot, especially yeah. in positions like this where you've got potential open diagonals on both sides of the board. And again, that's the obvious. Thanks, Captain. Obvious, right? Way to say that. That's when the bishops do well. But it, but it's true. And here comes Bishop C5 and. You know, even if even if one of the bishops disappears, like the light square bishop, when you own uh, the diagonals of an open board and and you've got targets there, like the pawn on f2, this is this is going to be something that Grover uh, Grover will be the one fighting fighting out of a slightly worse position here. And as you highlighted, this is not a this is not the mismatch you sometimes have in the in the first round of the Pro Chess League. 2600 and a 2200. This this is a grandmaster on grandmaster action here, and probably Black knows how to use the bishops. Um, yes, and as I think if he manages to place the, the light square bishop on d5 very quickly, I don't see how white is going to solve the issues on the king side in a sense that the g2 pawn will always be hanging if the knight wants to move away. Otherwise, right. black might want to just simply take on f3 and destroy black's, uh, white's pawn chain, double the pawns on the f file and have isolated pawns. All f2, f3, and h3 pawns would be isolated. Yeah, I wonder why black didn't play bishop d5 last move then. Maybe maybe what you're saying could have even maybe you could have got away with the last move, if you're mm. black. Yes, um, he could have played it earlier. Maybe he was afraid of the pin on the fifth rank if there was any yep. tactical. Element. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing at first, and then I thought maybe c4 you can take e5 and then move the bishop. But okay, it's um, it, interesting thought. I guess from the other perspective is it's good to be patient, right? Black has the bishop mm -hmm. pair playing bishop b6. You still spy this pawn on f2, and probably it's not going anywhere. Um, the next matchup is just getting underway, and there will be a lot of games to choose in that one. Um, but before we get to what's already going down with the Wizards, let's mention the other board that we haven't talked too much about, Abhijit Gupta versus Alexei Ivlev, because that one also has some pieces coming off the board. Um, yeah, this is a very similar situation to the previously yeah. mentioned game. Black has the pair of bishops, so the, uh -huh. the pawn structure is quite similar. As you can see, it's four pawns on, on the king side for both players and two pawns on the queen side. You would think that it's quite an equal position, but not, not it cannot be because Black has the pair of bishops and the yep. position is once again pretty open, and we love that for the bishops. Yeah, and you can already see that this is... This is uh... Black holding the cards here. I, I'm sure that right now he's choosing between do I just double rooks on the C file, right? Uh, or do mm -hmm. I play something like rook D6 first? Which file do I want to fight for? And rook D6 has the option of opening up this bishop on B7 in case I see some tactics there. So, you know, despite the equal structure, we may end up having some instructive things to talk about in terms of how the bishop here can outplay the other minor piece duo, right? Whether it's a knight and bishop or two knights. So, yeah, that'll be that seems to be a common theme. Let's uh, let's go look at kind of a weird one over here between uh, Sergei Gregorians, that's Sergio Chess 83, and Nubar mm -hmm. 1198, that's uh, oh. International Master Mohammed uh, Shaikh here. But we have this move D5 played super early. Uh, is this did did Black just forget to play the move D5 before castling, and and um. now we're in a weird position, or is this uh, is this a line that I guess. I guess this is a Nimzo, 
So, and I shouldn't, I shouldn't doubt Gregorians too strongly, but I feel instinctively like White has achieved a big goal of getting that pawn to d5, which is going to create some dysfunction here for the light square yes. bishop for black. And in this very moment, White is threatening to push that pawn to d6. Uh, that would be game over strategically. It's trapping the right. bishop. But also, if it didn't win the, the piece, uh, you cannot allow your opponent's pawn get to the sixth or the third rank because it will cut your position into two. The queen side cannot collaborate with the king side. So yep. black should push d6, I believe, to stop that. Yeah, or or I guess the other option is just take everything. No, okay, so he prefers your move d6. I was wondering if there was some idea to just take everything and try mm -hmm. to open up the position with a move like queen f6 at the end of the line, uh, hitting the rook on a1. But I, I obviously black decides that there's no reason to rush here. d6 is fine. Mm -hmm. And uh, so here, here, what happens if white plays the move e4? What are your thoughts on black's approach here to try to undermine the center here in the light squares? Um, I think d6 was the right move. I, I like that black has stopped white from pushing d6. Of course, it was a must. And I'm curious if white will manage to finish development quickly, because if the position opens up, the e-file especially, white's king is still in the middle of the board. So that could be a drawback of pushing d5 at such an early stage. Right. No, great point. And I guess that's something that you might look to do on e4. You might look to just take once and then play rook e8, and suddenly uh, white's got problems with the open king. Okay, and maybe that's why white decides that I'd rather play a move like knight g3 and get that bishop on f1 developed so that my king can rush out of the center. So Yeah. Shout out to Grandmaster Hikaru Nakamura, who is here with us in the chat. Of course, you guys know Hikaru, but if you haven't clicked on follow and subscribe on his channel, you got to do that right now. Uh, I got like a million gifted subs from Hikaru on my channel the other day for Valentine's Day. So thank you so much, Hikaru, and happy Valentine's Day to you too. He's gifting you subs and he's singing to me on Valentine's Day. Hikaru is a sweetheart. He's singing, oh, Danny boy. You know, oh. I know he's singing that to me personally. I know it. Um, <laughs> so we love we love this guy. Um, oh, we love Hikaru. Definitely go follow Hikaru. And uh, a reminder that it is it's Valentine's Day. Love is in the air. And what you didn't know is there's also a match going down after the Pro Chess League here today, which is mm -hmm. Hikaru Nakamura versus Andrew Tang. So that is yeah. a that is a really exciting one. Those two guys spending their Valentine's Day together. I think Hikaru is a big favorite in that matchup, but I'm curious to see what will happen in the format um, that uh, that makes that a, a close one. But uh, good luck to both those guys, and have have fun with that match later today. Yeah, um, and both of them will be streaming the the match, so it's gonna be a feast to yep. just follow the dual, games. Dual stream for sure. All right. Well, the other big name for uh, the Moscow Wizards is Vladimir Dubrov. Vlad Dubrov has taken on Vinny the Pooh, one of my favorite Chess.com usernames. Uh, that's Aditya Mittal, Mittal. Um and this this could be a crazy one because Mittal is already on on a bit of an attack here with the move queen to g4. Mm -hmm. Dubrov has an extra pawn, but that's typical in sort of this Botvinnik semi-slav. I prefer white first instincts, but that's because I love checkmate attacks no matter what the cost. But your thoughts on 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 what's going on in this position? I love grabbing extra material and having more pawns than my opponents, but I would go with you, Danny, that here White's initiative is looking promising, although we are in the opening stage of the game, and as you pointed out, this is normal in the Samislav but when it declines. So I'm curious how Black is going to react now to Queen G4, the pawn is hanging on G7, so you've got to do something about it. G6 yep. is one option, King F8. Uh, G6 weakens the dark squares, that's the drawback, and King F8 you can never castle. Uh, obvious, but it's true. But obvious but true. There's nothing wrong with that. And G6 weakens the dark squares, also obvious and true, and, and now on the board. Um, yeah, I mean, this is the kind of position that even if white doesn't have an immediate knockout blow here on it, this is just a position where you really worry about black's, black's long-term chances. I guess if white doesn't do something immediately, though, maybe black's next move is knight F6. Um, mm -hmm. And if he can kind of you know, beat back the Lions. Maybe he will get castled and not worry as much about the dark squares. So, so this could be a critical moment for uh, Mittal to to decide on how how White wants this position to go. Um, uh, if Knight takes D seven and and E five yeah. an option, I mean, to increase pressure on the dark squares and open up the Bishop, or maybe that's just not enough for White. 
Um, yeah, possibly, or just bringing the rooks to the central files, the D file, the E file, H4, H5 is also in the air. I think there are many, many plans for white here. I'm just going to ask you if, if we could go back to the previous match for a moment, because I see that the games are heating up. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, Florian has won an exchange against Grover, so we were actually right that Black had a pleasant position in the middle game, uh -huh. and he managed to increase his advantage. That should be even for the Stormbringers, and uh, their board one, Oparin, is attacking the board four of the dynamites. I thought this could be an instructive game to show with White's King being vulnerable now that the pawns are on the third rank instead of the second. The which one do we want to go to? Let's let's mention um, the one here real quick in terms of what happened sure. in the uh, in the Sahaj Grover game. But let's bring up both boards actually, so we can keep an eye on both Aparin Grigori's position and Sahaj Grover's game. So. To, to remind you what you missed, Anna and I were predicting that Black was in a great shape here uh, with the bishop pair. And after bishop b6, indeed, kind of simple moves here to open up the position led to good things for White. Now with the move bishop to c7, the reason White had to or, uh, part with the exchange is because moving the rook, uh, I think, would allow something like bishop f5 check. So White decided to give up the exchange for the pawn, but... Uh, not not really enough, I don't think, here, as, as Black is going to simplify this one out. Although, I guess Black has some technique to prove, but in an open board position where the Rook is already kind of flexing its muscles on the files, this is, this is likely going to be pretty straightforward for Grover. And so the other board, with Mittal and uh, Dubrov on, that's still from the other match. Let's, let's flip both boards back here to the, to the first match and bring up Oparin Grigori's board versus Manu David. Um... We've got the board one for the Stormbringers, Grigori. Oparin Grigori taking on Manu David. We're I finding like it. Black's position a lot. The only thing is, I wonder why he has spent so much time. Uh, he's got only four minutes left, Grigori yeah. Oparin, with the black pieces. Uh, he's almost 600 rating points above his opponent. That would usually give the player a lot of confidence and speed in terms of how quickly he makes his decisions. It wasn't the case today. Maybe he's just sleepy. But in Russia, it's not early. It's about, like, isn't it about the half past five or half past six? Yeah, not so, as late as yeah. sometimes they have to play, for sure. <laughs> it's in the afternoon already in Europe. Now, after Rook F8, clearly White has to deal with the hanging F3 pawn. Um, problem is that all the black pieces are really active. I love the Rook on the third rank. Mm -hmm. And if King G2... It's looking so suspicious that you're stepping onto the second rank where the queen and the king can get into trouble. Well, plus it's a light square too. You see that bishop on h7, not really in the fight yet, but you just you get really nervous about potential issues on the light squares here if you're white, and that bishop on b2 is just not that useful. So, uh, as we expected, Oparin Grigori is supposed to get wins when he's playing board four uh, for any opposing team, but looks like he's on his way. On the right side, we've got Alexei Ivlev versus Abhiji Gupta. Um, Mr. Gupta, I, I have it on, on good record, actually just got married, but was playing for the Pro Chess League uh, on his wedding day. So on his wedding day? <laughs> that was last week, and just if you want to know what Whoa. dedication is, Gupta, <laughs> Gupta just got married, and uh, but played for played for his team, the Dynamite, anyway, and... Um, that's good. That's good chess karma right there for your team, and hopefully that pays off for them this week. That's right now, really impressive. that's really impressive. And also mentioning this story on Valentine's Day, I think that's extra credit. It extra goes credit. To that his true love, his true love is chess, and second place, his family and wife. Somebody, somebody, his wife, right? True, true love is chess for a lot of people watching these shows. Bishop c4 played here. Interesting. I mean, I, I think it was sort of played out of necessity. I don't know that Gupta has. Um, the best winning chances in the world here after a move like rook to c7. And the reason we say that, everybody, is white's rook is already in an ideal situation in the uh, in the position behind the c-pawn and on the 7th rank. Something like g3 is usually the ideal setup. And the reason is that then you can put your king in a safe spot where it's shielded by all of your pawns and... There aren't a lot of weaknesses on the board. So the, the, the issue becomes with the C-pawn, and the reason the C-pawn represents more winning chances for Black is exactly what you're seeing now. Black is going to be in a position where he gets the pawn to C3, rook to C1, 
and he's going to debate whether he can just run the king in and sacrifice the, the kingside pawns, but ultimately win because of this pawn here. Um, this is what we are seeing. The king is already on e6, and uh, yeah. I think that black, before moving further with the king, he's going to push h5 so yep. that the h7 pawn won't be in the air. And after h5, king d5, king d4. But it's, it's usually a strategy that we see from the player that has an extra pawn, but sometimes it can backfire if you yep. give up too many pawns on the other flank. And uh, white can sacrifice his rook for the c pawn and start pushing his own pass pawns on the king side. Yeah, uh, if Hikaru is still in the chat, maybe he just knows the answer to these kind of rook endings. I wouldn't be surprised. I, I'm, I'm believing that, that this is not enough for... Um, for Black to have a win, usually there has to be something else in the position. I don't know that Black can afford to run in, even even with pushing the H pawn. But okay, Ivlev is going to take his time here before deciding. Can I really just sit tight? Because if I can, I'll do so and call Black's bluff. Are you going to run up and really let me go after the uh, the queen, the kingside pawn? So, um, I think that this position should end in a draw, which will be a a very successful starting result for the Stormbringers and Ivle Ivlev. Uh, getting a draw against Grandmaster Gupta. So, um... Indeed, this is board one of the Dynamites versus board four of the Stormbringers. Just a reminder, and uh, the Stormbringers are already one point up thanks to Froyano's victory against Grover. Also, they are probably winning. Uh, their board one operating should be winning yep. against Sutandram. But now that I'm looking at the position, uh, it's still some work to do, and he has only three minutes left. Good thing is that also White has spent a lot of time on the last move, so we're going to see time scramble, and that's when mistakes happen, and we love it. Blunders, we are expecting some blunders too. Yeah, inter interesting uh, time management, though I agree. It's almost like Grigori on that board is trying to come up with a mating attack that maybe isn't there. He's right now sort of shuffling the pieces and wishes he could get that bishop on h7 into the game somehow. I really like that move, bishop d4. Uh, by Manu David on the last move, just sort of sitting tight and making Grigori come up with something, and he may end up getting two minutes, uh, getting under two minutes, trying to come up with something. Um, yes, he's fighting very well, and once again, the storyline here is that we have a, a player rated at 2,000 facing a super GM, almost 600 rating points difference, and he so far he is managing to defend a very difficult position. Yep. A4 is a nice move there to keep counterplay on the queen side limited, especially when you believe you're the you're the the dominant one over there on the king side. So good technique by Grigori, I think, on a practical from a practical point of view. Um, oh, Hikaru is here with us in the chat. Yeah, he Hikaru says, is saying bishop to e4. Bishop to e4. Grigori game. So I'm gonna bring up the other the second board on analysis, and he's thinking that bishop to e4 maybe right here was an idea. Bishop e4, and if king g2, rook takes f3, that would have been really pretty. Right. Would have been game over. Rook takes f3, rook takes f3, and then you could take with both the bishop first or maybe even rook d2 first. I think the issue with bishop e4, though, is can white play g4 and unpin everything? Um, but Hikaru has g4, bishop takes f3, maybe some sort of queen takes g4 with a mating attack. This would have been This would have been crazy. Bishop takes f3 might actually might actually be enough. What is White's move here on Bishop takes f3? I don't know. Uh, and GW Wang is informing us in the meantime in the chat that Manu David's current live rating is over 2,400. He has gained hundreds of points in the last few months. Well, that is a good player to yeah. place on your lineup because the rating average has to be below 2,500 for all four players. And he is listed as a 2,000. Maybe there was queen takes f3 at the end of that line. But either way, crazy and amazing tactics by Hikaru there, and maybe something Grigori missed. Uh, he's now committed to this idea with queen h3, but Manu David has found a way to defend. And you highlighted, again, that's another interesting thing about the Pro Chess League, is finding those underrated board fours, right? Manu David is much higher than his uh, actual rating shows there. At a 2,000, he's, as you said, probably 2,400 strength and... A very good find there for the dynamite. Um, okay, we've got like several other games going still. Yeah, I was the... just going to give a special shout out to our moderators and Chess Bay. All the crew is here. BJ, Benjamin, welcome to the show, guys. This is the Process League Week Six. I see some of you are 
still having your morning coffee for most of these teams it's already afternoon so we are seeing the eastern division of the pro chess league and most of the teams are from asia and europe throwing my throwing my hat in the twitch chat ring uh shout out to everybody as anna just said and uh thank you for being here The uh, less chess talk. Well, that's that may be the first time I've ever heard that. Capablanca people are saying we want less chess talk and more and more tomfoolery. I can oh, deliver that. <laughs> we can totally deliver that. Uh, um, <laughs> There's a complaint. Right. Usually the other way around. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The um, all right. Well, this Gregory game is is definitely the most interesting and one of the one of the furthest along. But I also want to check back in real quick on India Lads game versus yeah, Mikhail Briakin because. That's the one that's, I think, closest to being finished. Black seems to have just won a piece here, swindled his opponent, and up on time as well, should be delivering a uh, a point for the Dynamite here. Um, yeah, that's good news for the Dynamites to tie the score 1-1. This should be a win, uh, I think... We can assume that the 2500, almost 2600 GM will manage to convert a piece up endgame. There are two pawns for white to compensate for the piece, but this is not the kind of position where yep. it's enough. Exactly. And and the reason why we say that this is not the kind of position that normally you would need these pawns much further advanced. Uh, and, and you kind of want them in an unblockadable setup. I think here, black can play bishop to b6 check. Um, although, okay, so... Let's 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 give a plan here for for those watching exactly how how does black want to best create a win? Um, king d6, I guess that makes sense. But but now the king comes back to e4 and threatens to run into f5. So something tells me he'll just have to go right back. Yeah, after king d4. Okay, here's what I would suggest: trying to force the pawns to light squares. Now, Indian lad is not doing that right now, but. If this bishop can force these pawns to f5 and e4, now you've got the ability to blockade on those squares, mm -hmm. which ultimately may allow your king to get in, and you kind of you kind of use that extra piece to to put your opponent in Zugzwang and force your way up the board. But I don't know how Black is uh, is doing that with his current plan. Maybe he's just yeah. relying on the fact that Briakin is also about to get himself under devastating time pressure, and, and he's not putting too much effort into technique. I think that's the case because White has only 15 seconds left and uh, he may just want to play on. What Black can do Switch. here is to go back and forth, shuffle around, anything but uh, repeating the position three times. Yeah. So he's taking his time to progress in this position. But I, I think, I mean, okay, like it's it's obviously going to still be one that only Black should win given Briakin's yeah. time pressure, but it's really not the best technique for our fans. Again, in this situation, <laughs> Black's best move is to go back to E6. You can't... Uh, he's going to allow is. this... Now Now here comes King F5. Oh, E6 to attack the E3 pawn, so if King F5, he wants to take on E3. But the point is, White should play King F5 and take with the King. Yeah, three G5. seconds left, two, one... He, oh. he has three seconds. He needs to move, but if he... If he plays this move and then takes with the king, I think that white has white white is totally fine. No, this is like this has been a collapse. I mean here here now yes. white can take, play king h five. Yeah, I'm I'm very I'm gonna I was it was in my tone, I didn't want to be overly critical, but I was really skeptical of how Indian Lad was playing this position. And again, the best approach, there was no reason not to put your bishop on this diagonal, everybody, and then make a waiting move. Put mm -hmm. your opponent in Zugzwang, where here's White's choices. Either push my pawns and, and, and allow them to begin to get blockaded, or to back up the king, which is going to create a scenario where black is, is, is on the aggressive march. And you're not really afraid of them taking on g5, because on king e5, all the pawns have been destroyed, and, and black can kind of pick them off. So this, is, this was just very poor technique uh, by Indian Lad here to be... To be totally honest, so yes, and I was too early to call this an easy win for Black because Black didn't manage to prove that it was an easy position. It yep. was, it was winning. It was a piece up, but he didn't manage to convert it. And now the G and H pawns gave enough compensation for White to yeah, hold the draw. Yeah, should be a draw now. Seven seconds, seven seconds left. So anything can still happen, but the position should already be okay for a draw. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, I guess. One interesting thing will be to back up at some point here and see exactly how the Abiji Gupta game ended because he did ultimately get a win in what I think should have been maybe a draw and rook ending. But, but okay, so instructive stuff and Grandmasters win games like that on a regular yeah. basis. 
And he um, pointed out that Black could have even blundered into a lost position if he had played King F6 instead of Bishop E5 after King F6, King H6, and White promotes the G pawn. Fantastic point. Yeah, just to show everybody just how just how far this game has come. Black was one move away from blundering, blundering a loss. Um, and and Black. Black isn't out of the danger of doing that just yet. I th I think King G4 and and one question for White will be, uh, is he in a position to play G7 and make a trade and then and, and now he's going to run to the king side. I think ultimately we mm -hmm. have a draw and the technique you're about to see everybody is Black can even shoulder with things like King H5 here mm -hmm. and then just meet the king as it runs over. We'll wait for him to do it and then we'll show that shouldering idea. This is instructive because, uh. The black king, okay, chose another route to get to get all the way here, making sure that by getting to the corner first, you cannot win with an extra pawn. But there were probably numerous ways to draw that. So, um, that this that was, was our first our first by Briakian. It saves half a point for his team, the Stormbringers. Yeah, and that means that the Stormbringers uh, would be winning the match uh, if Oparian won his game. Did he win his game? Oparian is still playing, and we should go back to that right now because this is absolutely crazy. Um, Ooh. Wait a what, second. <laughs> Where are the pieces okay. of white? He's just and winning. Okay, that was. <laughs> I, I flipped the board because I thought I was looking at it from Black's perspective. That's how dominant the position was up a queen. Um, and so, uh, anyway, Grigori does win. Uh, the Stormbringers do take a two and a half, one and a half lead into the second round of play. And we move on to uh, matches that are still going. So, um, and so, so where where to go? Half, yes. And in the other match, let's see which position is the most exciting. Let's go quickly check on the main one we've got up, which is Vlad Dubrov's game, uh, mm -hmm. playing the black pieces for the Wizards. Because seems like yeah, it seems like he's moments away from winning. I was looking at it, thinking I don't I don't see why Rook B two isn't game over. Um, now C2, I believe, will be resign, resign town, population white. And the reason mm -hmm. is white cannot take it because after trades, the A2 pawn runs and it's over. So uh, Dubrov taking his time here, but I think C2 is, is game over for this one. Yeah, it's important to mention that the Wizards have lost th three points on the standings. Uh, it's a penalty point that was uh, deducted because they changed their lineup yep. three of the players that they they were originally registering for today's round couldn't make it and they had to replace them that is three minus points because of those replacements and some people wonder why we have those strict penalties it's precisely because of that because in an, in, a, in a global league uh even if it sometimes seems unfair to one team, it have to be fair to all teams. And in a global league, when people are preparing for their opponents, they're planning all week based on lineups that were posted publicly. Last minute changes can can really change the game if if uh, in favor of one team. So that's why there are such strict penalties there. So, um, all right. Well, Dubrov is about to convert this one. Let's take a look quickly at uh, Gama Grama's game versus Wizard Four Five Six, because this one is also about to come to a close um is uh uh let me catch up with you so it's the umanov gosh game isn't yeah, it? it 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 ended in a draw and i was i was asking a question i didn't have time to finish i was thinking is it is this a win for black is there winning chances but it turns out no um yeah with the pawn pushed to a2 um Black can never move away the rook from a1 if the white yep. king is h2 on g2. And black would need an f pass pawn, at least f, e, d, c, any pass pawn, but not g or h. So with g or h pawns, it doesn't matter if black is two pawns up, it's still a theoretical draw position. Yep. And uh, they did end up agreeing on that draw. Uh, the, the other grandmaster playing for the Wizards this week, Sergei Gregorians. Has the black pieces and and maybe maybe a lot of dynamic stuff going on. Remember, we left this one a little bit ago in that weird Nimzo on it, but now now this position has become uh, not very Nimzo looking, but kind of unique. Black black is threatening to move Queen H4 on the board. Uh, there's um 
immediate issues to deal with here with the move bishop to d4 by white trying to eliminate what was a threat of something like knight f2 check. Uh, your thoughts on on whether black has enough here to justify white's big center. Again, I've kind of liked white all game for some weird reason, even mm -hmm. though I know Gregorians is the better player, and, and also I play the Nimzo as black, so my emotions deceive me today. I have no <laughs> idea why, but but I feel like this big center and these tactics are, are not great for black. Yeah, I feel the same way. And he's trying to create attack on the king side, which can be dangerous. Now, after knight e3, white has to take on e3. The, the f4 pawn can be in the air. Sometimes bishop takes h3 sacrifice. Could work, for instance, uh, like now. Ooh, like right <laughs> now, oh, like d takes d6 three. was a horrible blunder. That was uh, nothing, like, nothing like the board completing your sandwiches, right? Your sentences. <laughs> The board, like maybe right now, I think you just, I think White just blundered, and we saw it right in front of us. I, I expected resigned. something that would prevent this because it was obvious that Black was aiming for this. Yep. Uh, the king cannot go to g1, so it's it's a mate after well, g takes. I, I think the move king h2 would have been just fine for White. Maybe yes. not. I mean, maybe Black still has some sort of attacking chances, but I guess Knight takes f4 was a threat as well. But here, now now Gregorian just wins on time. White's like, well, I missed that. Might as well lose on clock, right? Because then I can tell people, <laughs> well, I was doing fine. I lost on time. Um, yeah, I I guess he didn't find a way. There's no move. I don't think that he can defend after bishop takes h3. But as Danny said, he could have just protected the h3 pawn with king to h2 instead of capturing on c6. So he clearly blundered Black's plan. Well, in the uh, the last game of this first round matchup between the Wizards and the Movers um, is uh, between Selverstov versus Boscaron. And uh, yeah, that game. Uh, those of you wondering what happens to the players that couldn't make it, uh, we have our Pro Chess League Commissioner Greg Shahade here in the chat with the information that you get the substitutes uh, instead of the originally picked players. Buscaron, I think, is just moments away from winning this game. You look at it and uh, always have to gather yourself in rapid chess to make sure you're seeing it right. But he's up the exchange. I don't think White has any sort of immediate tactics, which means that things like Rook D1 check are uh, are in the air. Mm -hmm. So with this with this win here, the movers. Well, it will inch a little bit closer. The Moscow Wizards have already secured kind of a, a first set of games victory here with a two and a half, one and a half lead. So, Boscaron really needs to win this game, I guess, from that perspective to make sure the match doesn't get away from the movers. Yes, if the Wizards win this match, then they will have some chances to qualify for the playoffs. So far, they are in the in the sixth place after the three penalty points, and there's quite a big gap between them and the Dynamites, who are the fourth place team. 93 check was a nice intermezzo, everybody. Obviously, the one uh, idea White had left in his pocket was this back rank threat against the king. So bishop b2, for those wondering, was trying to deflect the queen away because because checkmate would hurt, right? So mm -hmm. um, Black played this nice intermezzo 93. Now he's going to play rook d1 with check. Then he's going to take b2 with check. And then he's going to finish off the mating net. So just nice little technique there to make sure he he completes this one off with discipline. Uh, King F3 is just a fancy way to say I don't want to resign yet, but even G6, if I was Boscaron, eliminate the mating threats and with it, win the game. Let's take a quick moment before we move on to the next couple matches to mention something, kind of a new a new addition we're going to have here in the Pro Chess League Weekly Show, just to kind of mention who some of these players are. Everyone has now become a little more familiar with these teams, but there's so many faces playing in the league that maybe you don't know very well. So let's mention a couple. We reached out to all the players in the league and asked them to tell us some fun facts about themselves. Nikita Meshkovs, who's about to throw down for the Estonia Horses, said in school he used to record a lot of rap songs, Anna. What do you think Ooh. about that? You see him as, well, a, as like the next Eminem? Uh, I hope so. And that makes me think about my rapping career because I'm hanging out with the chess singer Huga, and she is going to make me perform in one of her next videos, and I have to learn to rap. So maybe I can take some lessons from Nikita. I, 
First of all, I cannot wait to see you rap. Uh, but Georgia <laughs> Bava, who will be playing against Mr. Meshkovs, that's board one on board one crime for the Tbilisi Gentlemen versus the Estonia Horses. Uh, Jababa, I don't think took any of our questions seriously, so we're gonna we're gonna just <laughs> display them anyway. We asked him how he prepared for his pro chess league matches. He says boxing against the walls. Thanks, Bador. Appreciate that, buddy. Um, we've uh, we've got a a get to know you from one of the stars of the 2018 pro chess league, maybe the stars, Zavin Andriasian helped lead the Armenia Eagles to the Pro Chess League Championship. And uh, one of the things that all the players got when they came to the live final in San Francisco, Anna, you were there, was we, mm. we made these really awesome kind of custom jerseys. You see he's wearing it. It looks yeah. like a professional sport jersey. So uh, good to mention that one of his favorite sports teams is Real Madrid. Yeah, I'm totally on the same side with him. I think that's a great pick. So I'm rooting for Andresian now, from now on forever. For, after for new hearing. reasons. Yeah. Uh, the man who just took home a win there for the movers to help bring it closer was Adiban Baskaran. Uh, back to some chess, a little bit away from the pop culture world. We asked him his favorite opening. He said the King's Gambit. And I was disappointed to read that on him, mainly because I don't think we've seen a King's Gambit by Baskaran so far in the league this year. Yeah, he, he's got to play it in the Pro Chess League, but I do remember him from the Tata Steel Chess Tournament 2017 when he played really extreme openings. He played the Scandinavian against Carlson. He played the French defense against Karyakin, and he chose the King's Gambit against Wesley So. So I'm hoping that he will come back to his fun openings. Yeah, I, I can't wait to see that. That's all I'm saying. I, I love it, but hey, give me some King's Gambit. I could use the spice. Yeah. And and <laughs> then we've got our... our well... I'm just going to say it was the, 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 the best way to talk about Vlad Dubrov's most interesting fact that might surprise people is on Valentine's Day because there's nothing wrong with love. Um, and, and love, in Dubrov's case, led to more than 20 children around the world. Anna, oh, your wow. thoughts? Um, I am speechless. Uh, <laughs> I'm a little shocked. <laughs> um, I hope that those, those, all those 20 children know how to play chess and one of them will become the next Carlson. I. You know what? We can only hope. Um, we saved the best for last on this Valentine's Day. Vlad Dubrov, <laughs> um, way, to, way to bring the love around the world. And I, I don't think you were trolling us. So if that's, if that's a true thing, then um, good for you, buddy. Good for you. All right. We, uh, I, have four, I have four kids on, as you know. And I am, I'm about two kids, I'm about two kids uh, far from sanity. I left my sanity behind two kids ago. So, I mean, I, I don't know exactly how, he's, how he can afford that kind of thing, but all right. Um, 20 each kids all around the world. <laughs> well, we've got the matchup between the Eagles and the Phoenix, which is kind of a cool bird-on-bird -bird logo there. you got bird versus bird, right? Who would win, an eagle and a phoenix? I guess a phoenix would win, you know, given hmm. that it's, you know, it can, like, rebirth from ashes and stuff, right? Yeah. So good point. Good point there. But, and uh, the, the previous week, we had the battle between the bishops and the knights. That's when the New York Marshals tweeted about the eternal battle, whether the knight or the bishop is a better piece in chess. And they won the match, the, the knights. Believe it or not, Chess Bay, I was once sane. Okay, so <laughs> thanks for that. I was once sane. And you can talk to my kids about that. But uh, Anna Sargisian, let's talk real quick. We, we mentioned mm -hmm. um, some of the strategy when you build a team, Anna, about finding low-rated board yeah. fours. But one of the other things about the league when you build when you build the infrastructure of your team is that women players have, the, have a 100-point sort of bonus. So that allows mm -hmm. sometimes the managers to structure their lineup to allow strong female players to compete and uh, take advantage of that. So Anna Sargisian has has been doing that all year. I mean, honestly, the Eagles um, have, have been right in the thick of things. Again, on their way to the playoffs, it seems. They are the defending champions, and Sargisian has been a big part of that. Yes, I have her on my fantasy team because I think she has been really impressive. In this game, unfortunately, she's a piece down and she's not getting the C pawn because knight f7 was a counter check to rookie 7 check, not something that you see often. And so in this game, she is going to lose to the top board of the Phoenix, but I think that she has been doing very well. And as Danny said, female players get an extra 100 bonus points when it comes to rating average calculation. They count as if they had less rating points with 100 points less. That is cool for the rating average. So if you think that's yep. the other way around, no, this is to benefit female players. Yep, to benefit and to encourage more, uh, more, more female players to play in the league. And um, it's something that uh, we, we really 
think has, has been good for the league. And like you said, it may end up helping teams like the Eagles go all the way, uh, go all the way this year. Sargisian has been very good. Um, another Sargisian has Sean Sargisian, uh, or Sar Sar Sargsian, Sargsian. Um, I don't know exactly how to say things sometimes. Um, I think Sargisian is perfect, and I'm sure that Robert was giving you some tips on how to pronounce the Armenian names. Yeah. Uh, well, Sargsian is also doing well for the Eagles all year. And with uh, Sargisian actually losing here, Sargisian might actually help the uh, the Eagles fight back. H how's he going to push the beep on? It seems like there should just be, we should be a move away from White figuring that out um, for this yes. pawn. He just needs to make sure that he prevents Queen takes F2 and the perpetual check. That's the last hope of Black to create perpetual. Yep. But after King G2, there's no, there's not a second check. And if uh, Black plays, for instance, Queen to B1 to threaten with Queen E4, Queen E5 is a check, and then White promotes. So this should right. be game over. And I think at some point what White will find is a move like Queen to C7, and and you know it'll be a little bit counterintuitive to allow something like. And here he goes, and because Queen takes G5 comes, but but then when the King moves, the Queen guards the C1 square. Queen to B5 check is is I I believe probably only a matter of time before it runs out as long as White finds the right moves and. And actually, Queen D5 looked like a terrible, terrible way to to try to get that perpetual. Um, yeah, as... now next move is promotion, or if King G6, he can play first Queen F6. There's check. also Queen F6 <laughs> even here if you really want to yes. just right Indeed. bring down the hammer of counterplay. And that was beautiful after Queen C7. I don't know if you had time to show it on the board that if Queen takes G5 check, White well, was going to play Queen to G3, and it was game over. Aha. Uh -huh. Exactly. I was actually highlighting the queen's sort of geometry guarding c1, but mm -hmm. you're right. Queen g3 was just the, the reason the g5 pawn was, was not touchable. So yeah, um, keeping my tactics in check. Thank you for that. Uh, you've been doing more puzzle rush than me. I mean, um, let's, I have two streams about puzzle rush, but I'm really addicted, and I should stream more so that I can play more because I promised I only play on stream. Yeah, difficult. The... Really difficult. <laughs> Well, there's already been some other games in the book, so if we want to leave this one up so we can see how Sargsyan finishes it, let's mention quickly some of the other games that have already come to a close. Zavin Andreasian, that's Zavin Chess Mood, got a win as board one. Uh, Mickey Tarion also uh, got a... Actually, no. No, Mickey Tarion lost. That's a hike uh, Materosian oh. lost to uh, Afanasiev and... That's a big game there for the Phoenix. So, mm -hmm. um, those are some so of the games we missed. So, another player from the Phoenix, from the team of the Moscow Phoenix, manages to beat um, Marty Rossian. That's an upset, clearly. Well, and the um, the other matchup that we already kind of previewed, especially as we went through our playoff cards or our player cards, excuse me, is already underway, um, and that is between the Tbilisi gentlemen. And the Estonia horses. I just brought up the game between Nika Volkov and Nikita Meshkov. So that's first, second versus Volkovi. Um, mm -hmm. This one yeah. is about to be kind of weird. A lot of pieces hanging. We missed the start yes. of this one, but Volkov, for those of you who don't know, has been kind of a hero all year for the Tbilisi gentleman on the other end, board four. He's been an MVP candidate, really. Yes, and what's interesting about him is that his classical rating is 2100, and that's the rating that counts for the Process League, but his Blitz rating is about 2500. Right. I I feel like I have... I, I, I don't have a 400-point rating discrepancy in anything. Just all my ratings are going down together. So it's very interesting <laughs> when you see somebody who's so much stronger in faster time controls. And, and that's partly... I think part of the reason for that is not even a purposeful sort of, call it sandbagging. I think the thing is that... What's what's so about modern day chess on a rapid and blitz are just a lot more accessible. A lot more people are playing rapid and blitz, and so if you improve your chess and you've studied and worked on your game, there's a much more much more opportunities generally to play in rapid and blitz tournaments than there are to play classical tournaments. I mean, especially for those who are working regularly on the weekend, and mm -hmm. so I think um, I think that's a big reason why you you see that discrepancy there. I agree with you fully. And I'm curious what's going to happen after B5. As you mentioned, so many pieces are hanging, and the most important is that the queen on C4 is under attack, so what has to react to this B5 push? A yep. takes B5, A takes B5, queen takes B5. What's the trick there? Knight C3 fork should be the solution. But also the C8 rook will be hanging, so this yeah. is something to calculate. 
Yeah, well, it has to calculate. There's moves like queen b7 and queen d7 in the air, yeah. if that happens. Um, Maybe the only thing that black wants there is that if queen b7 or queen d7, he's going to move the rook away from c8, even, even if it has to be rook e8 or rook f8, which is a rather yeah, passive. Even rook but... a8, but yeah, the, when the rook moves, the point is, as you said, the, yeah. the rook on d1 is still hanging and the b4 pawn is hanging, right? Indeed, he just wants to create a B post pawn, and that would be an extra pawn. Very promising post pawn because the B1 square is already under control of the C3 knight, so he's gonna push B3, B2 rather easily. Yeah, yeah. B5, a, a nice little intermezzo there, and uh, okay. One of the things about this this uh, game is also the time pressure. The the stronger player Meshkovs is under under mm -hmm. time pressure as of this moment, but. Um, looks like Volkov's time advantage will disappear after this move, this nice fine B5. So, all right, let's keep an eye here on this one. This is, as we said, the board one matchup for the horses versus the board four of the gentlemen. But the uh, we got to quickly mention that the board one, board four matchup the other way was over very quickly. Lexi Sexy, uh, that's Bador Jabava, one, one of the most popular usernames. He won very quickly as black here uh, for the... For the Tbilisi gentleman, we can run through that real quick and show you how he won with the Carol Khan, no less, in, in really crushing style. That's like winning with the French in crushing style, right? That doesn't happen Indeed. very often. It's the same, basically. They are brothers and sisters, the Carol Khan and the French defense. And I love seeing Badur Jabal because he, he's such a creative and original player. This is a traditional opening for yep. someone like Badur. Yeah, and it G5, looks like he... I love that move when he took on G4 and G5. Yeah, and uh, then found this tactic with rook takes h2 and um, he headed into an endgame where he was up a pawn but also had the better minor piece, the bishop versus the knight in an open board, and and he knew how to use it. He did so with a very strong attack and uh, just went on to win very quickly. So a, a tough matchup for any board forward to face Badur Jababa, but and, and this time it just it went over very quickly. So... Um, Let's let's bring up our our two board view here and check out some of the other games while we keep an eye on Meshkov's game versus Volkovi. I'm gonna mm -hmm. I'm gonna focus on this one here because we should also mention how Ponsulia uh, won a big game over Jan Elvis. Let's back this up. People oh. can watch that game over there on the left to see what happens between Volkov mm -hmm. and Meshkov's. But Anna, this is a Okay, not necessarily an upset, but I, I think of Elvis as normally getting wins in these early rounds. But maybe in this case, now that he's not the top board uh, like Meshkovs, he does have a much much tougher matchup against Ponsulia than he normally would. Yes, those of you who are not familiar with Jan Elvis' name, he used to be world number four in the world in classical chess, and he's still a very active grandmaster. In the Pro Chess League, he has been present since the very first edition of the Pro Chess League, and I don't remember a week where he didn't play for his team. Very dedicated player and usually yep. performs very well for the horses. Yeah, agreed. And again, maybe that's just where my bias is getting to me. And Looking at it on paper, I mean, the truth is Ponsulia is is actually higher rated than Elvis at this point. And, and you know, uh, we know that Jan is formerly, as you said, a world top five and very good at the Pro Chess League. But this is why the gentlemen have just been so good all year. I mean, they're bringing Jababa on board one, Ponsulia here. You've got a, a super underrated, rapid kind of specialist on board four there. That's Nika, Nika Volkov on the left. Mm -hmm. You can see him against Meshkov. So this is why the gentlemen have just been so tough. And here Ponsulia just crashes through with this exchange sacrifice on c6 which is kind of kind of brilliant against elvis and then queen takes b6 and a huge attack ensues for white um beautifully played by pantulaya bishop d5 queen c7 and now queen d6 and black just resigns in view of the threat of both knight h5 check as mm -hmm. well as the threat of queen e7 just wow really impressive stuff there um for Ponsulia and the gentleman. Yeah, he could have still tried uh, Queen E8 to protect both the E7 and H5 squares, but I guess he saw that a move like Knight E4 was coming, the F6 pawn is hanging, and then Knight C5, the A pawn can... Well, yep. no, the A pawn not. I was like, the A pawn can run too, but it's not so easy to keep the A pawn alive. But the, the, simply the attack against the Black King is so strong that he decided it was time to give up. And... Uh... 
this game here, the 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 only game that's still going. Um, shout out to Z Nation Chess for all the uh, all the love and the gifted subs. Really appreciate it, and everybody in chat. Thanks for being here. Um, we've uh, we've got Volkov again, maybe on his way to holding here against Grandmaster Meshkovs. He's he's down a pawn, but with everything being simplified to one side of the board, it makes you think that White should be just fine here. Yes, and he's got a pair of bishops. Uh that should give some composition plus this pin on the fifth rank now, everything is hanging both the knight and the bishop the knight cannot jump away because the rook would be in the air i wonder what can black do well he has to perhaps... i think i think there's i think there's rook b1 check and on yeah. and on king f2 knight e4 you have knight e4 with check but yeah no you're right it's very weird right king f3 and then the next move is uh it's like about to lose a piece <laughs> Can he even save one of them? Uh, maybe maybe there's a move like F5 in some positions, um, although it looks like um, White could even just take E5 there. So I think he messed it up. It was a pawn up for Black, but now I don't see how he can escape from losing one of his pieces. Maybe, maybe something is escaping me. Um, oh, maybe there's 90... Uh, no, sorry. Uh, okay, uh, no, 94 immediately. I was thinking you couldn't take E5 because Rook B1, but of course you can just take the Rook. Um, maybe the thing is, he if he gives up the E4 knight, then Black will have F5 fork, so he just needs to move away the E5 bishop and then win back the piece, the G4 bishop. Right. Good point. Right. So I hear if 94 check, King F3, bishop takes H2, for example, right? And then King takes E4, there's F5. Hmm. Yeah, I think that should be the way to bail out, but that's but, already... Uh, as you said, I mean, in that position, it's just... Okay, it should be a draw, but White is. White is completely fine, and Mez Mezhkovs may have let Volkov off the hook again. This guy is... This, this guy has, again, board fours don't often win the MVP race in terms of how we kind of rank that, and that's, you know, because the top boards are typically facing off against more mm -hmm. consistently strong opposition. Yeah. Um, but, I mean... Uh, Volkov, if you just want to talk about, you know, there's like the most valuable player, and then there's just the players that seem to be leading the way on like a on like an emotional energy level for your team. And Volkov has been the hugest surprise and the biggest win for the gentleman this year. Yeah, I'm just looking at the early, the moves earlier in this game because we thought that Black had the advantage, and after the capture on B5, Black didn't play Knight C3, a move that we liked. And we analyzed with Danny instead. He went rook b8, and it seems it wasn't going to work because of this fifth rank pin. Well played by Nika Volkov, saving an important half a point. If this is the case that yeah. we have just evaluated, but you may be right. Maybe maybe knight c3 was the best move. Um, I really liked it. I I thought that was Black's idea, but apparently yeah. it wasn't. Okay. Well, the line that we just predicted is on the board. Uh, bishop takes h2 is played. I expect Volkov to capture on e4, and and likely f5 check. Everything peters out into a mm -hmm. uh, into a draw. But okay, let's not let's not go anywhere on this one because of the time pressure, and we may end up catching some magic on on camera here, right? You know, lightning yeah. in a bottle. And um, this is the last game in the match between the gentlemen and the horses. So, so far, it's a one-point lead for the Georgians. If they can hold this game, that will be two and a half. They are winning the first round. Reminder that every match consists of four rounds. Every player will play against every other player. So, board one against board four. Board four is the first round, but you're going to see each and every player from both teams facing each yep. other. And... Uh... The line, as we said, the line predicted. So is there any, any sort of tricks left here? I mean, if you're Volkov, you only have 20 seconds, but you start getting a little excited about the fact that you're close to Black's King and maybe, you know, get ideas into your head like Rook D8 check and a mating net. But no, uh, Meshkov's plays Rook F1 check. And, okay, I think there's probably a number of moves here if he really wants to make it simple. Even play Bishop G1, offer the trade. No, he doesn't. Okay, maybe he's going to try to swindle Volkov under time pressure. Let's see. Yeah, this is clearly what he's aiming for since White has less time, but I think if Nika Volkov has survived the position he had earlier, he's going to be okay defending this. Yep. It's equal material. The only problem is that he's got 13 seconds left on the clock. It's a two-second increment, so no one can flag if they keep playing quickly, but two seconds, that's not much time to think. But there's always, even if they don't flag, there's always a chance of a blunder, and now that move G3 makes me think that 
Mezhkovs has to be careful about pushing too hard. Now he's using his time. Look at this. The move king a3 Ooh. is coming. He's panicking. Yeah, okay, he's but now bishop of 4 can be played. Bishop d2 was a threat. He played bishop d4. I think bishop of 4 was even better with the idea of, of the king coming to h3 and trapping the bishop. But yeah, and now he may not have anything better than... Oh, what? He has rook g8. I thought he had rook g8 stopping rook h1 because bishop e3 was mate. <gasps> No, oh, okay, not a blunder bishop. I thought it was a blunder bishop. Rook yeah, e4. Rook e4 to defend the, the bishop. Okay. And now it's still a draw. It should be a draw. Eight uh, seconds left for both players. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back up the analysis board here because I really think that Volkov may have missed his chance for a full point upset in this position right here with bishop f4. Yes. Although I guess, I, guess he, I guess he was worried about bishop g1. The bishop would have gotten out. So he tried to go for yeah. the mating net. And probably with best play, it was just going to be a draw the whole time. But they, all right, they gave us some excitement. Really exciting game. And Nika Volkov, the underrated player here, board four versus board one of the horses, he managed to hold a very difficult game. So yep. I think this is a this was a brilliant performance by Volkov. Uh, shout out to everyone who has just joined us. We are over 2,000 chess friends from all over the world. This is Valentine's Day, and the best way to celebrate Valentine's Day is by hanging out on Twitch on our chess channels. This is chess.com's main channel, and the Pro Chess League is the best online team competition in the world with some of the top players, uh, the very best of the chess scene, including world number two, Fabiano Caruana, Hikaru Nakamura, Wesley Sol, Maxim Vashelagrav, they all have their own teams. Thank you for being here, everybody. Let's let's bring up. Let's try to catch up as quickly as we can with this Stormbringers matchup versus the Dynamite. We'll keep that board on the left and bring up a second one here between Fra Fralianov and Manu David, um, because the board on the left is the matchup of board one versus board three of the Stormbringers versus the Dynamite. For those who don't know the format, um, it is a an all play all uh, sort of Sheveningen round robin for your team play, but. But the one on the right is uh, just as just as important. Uh, Manu David is actually the board four for the Dynamite, uh, taking on board two for the Stormbringers, and this is this is a messy position. Maybe maybe Manu David's rook on e two has gone too far after this move. Bishop f one. I actually it actually looks like the d two pawn is just going to fall next move. Yes, he has played rook e one because he's hoping that this d pass pawn could give him counterplay. But Make a trade. After... It, it's going to do that, I guess. But the thing is, White still maintains winning chances. And I look at Bishop C4, and look at that King awkwardly on F8. Like it's oh, he doesn't go for it. I thought Bishop C4 might have been a weird way to just kind of punish the King from being on F8, because there's all kinds of weird mating net ideas now. But um... he was threatening Rook takes C5 after Rook C1, so that was uh -huh. a sneaky move, uh, aiming for a fork on D7 was spotted by Manu David, he plays king e8, and now rook to b1, rook b8, the back rank is really weak. Normally the king would be on g8, and there can be back rank mates because they f7, g7, h7 pawns, don't let the king yep. move away. It's still almost a back rank mate with rook b8, because black has to give up the knight on c8 to survive. So the king's going to run out, but this is... This is a position where if you put the black king on a safe square and, and there weren't all the tactics we're kind of looking at, probably black, black would be in a decent chance to hold a draw down a pawn. But when you combine the fact that black is down this extra f pawn and that this king is is kind of on the run from mating ideas, I like this check move, even if you just play like rook h8. Okay, rook e8 is also possible, mm -hmm. but this is not an easy position for black to hold. The king is on the wrong side of the board to 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 defend these weaknesses over here. So um I like White's chances to win this one. Yes, I think White is going to convert it. He's got more time, extra pawn and better pieces. Also thanks to the F1 bishop and the E5 knights, it's very difficult for black to try to create any counter chances against the white king. It's a very safe king while the black king is, as you said, on the wrong side of the board. If so we we'll move, move on down. to another game in this match, because I'm expecting a win for the Stormbringer here with the white pieces. Okay, then go for it. Uh, this position between Indian Lad and Ivlev, that is board two of the Dynamites facing board four of the Stormbringers. It was a Rui Lopez, as you can see from the structure. 
I'm looking for the game with Indian Lad. I actually don't. Oh, there it is. Okay, so Indian Lad um, here, as you said, versus Ivlev in the same match. It's a very good Spanish, I would say. Usually in the Rue Lopez, I don't see why having these many active pieces the knight very well very well plays on d5 and also on g5 plus white has the open a5 the one and only open a5 with the rook on a6 already attacking on the sixth and putting pressure on this knight on c6 i wonder what should be the follow-up here i'm looking at moves like f4 uh-huh yeah f4 would be the kind of the principled move, right? You've already got these two pawns facing the king side. F4 only opens up more avenues for pieces to get involved. Certainly it's double-edged because you open up your own king and always be aware of the potential consequences there. But I, I would probably play F4 without thinking and then, you know, we got other problems. But um, I like F4. I also, I mean, okay, I even like the move h4, I guess. I, I like the idea of white just doing what you can to build up the potential of an attack on the king side. Um, I think that I think that white might also be considering taking taking one of these pieces. He, he actually takes mm -hmm. the knight on f6, and I wonder if it's because he has knight takes f7 and queen h5. What's going on mm -hmm. here with these tactics? Indeed, what about that? Yeah, I, was, I wasn't looking at Queen H5 earlier, but you're completely right that their tactics are already potentially with the H7 and F7 pawns being so vulnerable. So Bishop takes F6, if Knight takes F7 or Queen H5, we got to see which one is more precise. Yeah, you may be, I mean, Queen H5 may be more precise. It's not as flashy, I guess, because Black can take on G5, but that would part with the Bishop pair, and, and now White has, you know, just all kinds of pressure everywhere. So... So queen h5 may be the the simple follow up. I was I was first looking at knight f7 just to see if it worked, but it may not. Yeah, maybe maybe knight takes f7 didn't work actually because after rook takes and queen h5, uh, black didn't have to play g6. Black could have defended the f7 rook with something like hmm. queen e8 or queen e7. So. Um, so now, now, now what White has achieved is getting the pair of bishops yeah. and he doubles rooks on the a5. This is a position where White is dominating on every part of the board. You see him yep. attacking the king side, but he's also on the queen side with his rooks. I would definitely be very sad playing this as black. Well, let's, uh, as we've said, everybody, you, that's the board one matchup of the Stormbringers versus the board three, the Dynamite. An interesting one, but l let's jump back to this game between Fralianov and Manu David, just because I think we're about to see the finish. This is still a position where we think that White should win, but I didn't want to miss the idea of Knight E3 coming for Black and the potential mating net uh, against the White King, because, okay, White has two minutes to figure it out. We expect there to be something, right? But... But this is, uh, this is a potentially crazy moment with both sides under mutual time pressure and the dangers of dealing with a rook and knight kind of mating net. He plays knight to d3, so if knight e3... Now the rook the... would fall. Oh, what the... He almost flagged over. He almost flagged. <laughs> I rook... looked at the clock, it was 2, 1, and no time. He played rook d1. I was thinking even rook b1 was fine. But yeah, he almost flagged there. Uh, White still has to deal with the threats of knight e3, though. So, rook e5, king d4, rook takes f5, there's oh, knight rook takes two... e4 and fork. Oh, rook knight takes e4 and fork. Fork, fork emote. Fork knight. Fork Yay. emote. Fork knight. Is there a fork knight emote? Is I that like ripping off fork knight? knight? I, kept, I keep saying fork knights, so I definitely need an emote for it. <laughs> Did you just say that accidentally, fork knight? No, I... I think I said it on purpose a couple of streams ago, and then it became a <laughs> thing. That's so I awesome. Need an for it. I love it. Fork Knight. Um, okay, well, Fralianov does get this win. We, we, caught, the, we caught the last moment of it. Um, as we've said there on the uh, left-hand side, it looks like Oparin Grigori will do what he's supposed to do and convert that rook ending. Um, I'm trying to figure out if there's any chance of... The, the other season. game we were looking at, as we said, is the one uh, in this matchup between Indian Lad and... Uh, oh, wait, and, Black blundered in the Rukan game? Oh, oh, he just blundered or? mate. Well, not not yes. quite mate, but I'll show the on the analysis board, everybody. We we just had this position where, okay, it's, it's a blunder, but also Black was on the verge of losing, right? I mean, this yeah. is a hard position to hold. G6 is falling. Rookie 5 mate is actually being threatened on the board, right? And so this Indeed. is... Uh, 
Black Black panics with the king and moves the rook to d7, but but uh, resigns immediately because because of this move coming. So very well played by Oparin, converting this pawn up rook end game with very active rooks. He's got uh, yep. yeah, it was a mating attack thanks to uh, controlling the d file, activating his king. Typical way of converting an end game. So you gotta you gotta learn from it. Very instructive game. So there's uh, the game as as we as we said, uh, Indian Lad and Ivlev. I don't know why this one, even though it's in the same matchup between the Dynamite and the Stormbringers, is so far behind the others. There must have been, mm. must have, I don't know. Maybe the the commish who I know is listening in the chat can tell everybody what happened there. But um, the, the, we actually have games that are much further along than this one on the clock. Here, uh, here, White is better. But let's let's check in on the games between the matchup of the Wizards. Um, I don't even know where to go. Actually, there's several exciting games. Let, let's go to the game between Vlad Dubrov and Nubar 1198 because there's a knight on d5, and I don't know how the bleep we got this position. Can I say how the bleep? <laughs> Is that legal? I think that's legal. Okay. How the bleep let's, did we get this position? Let's go back to that position where White pushed d5 on move 15. Just taken with the e pawn, and then bishop takes f6, g takes, and knight takes d5. Here we go. Wow. Really interesting okay, piece. I just D takes D5, Bishop takes D5, traps the rooks. And if yep. knight C6, Bishop takes C6, it still catches the rook next move. So disaster. It looks like a disaster for black. Yeah, and a nice tactic. Again, this is, you know, from an instructive point of view, I think that how do we learn to spot these tactics in our games, everybody? Well, black's king is still in the center, okay? And even though that's not, you know, a get-out-of-jail-free card to play, make bad sacrifices, it should be sort of a warning signal for you in your own games to do the... I mean, someone's king in the center is one thing, but how do you punish it? You punish it by opening the center, right? Creating opportunities. And so, you know, it it it's nice when grandmasters give us those instructive moments and they don't just break the rules, Anna, right? Here he's not breaking yeah. the rules. He's actually <laughs> providing an instructive moment to say, hey, look, Black's king is in the center, even though it doesn't look like there's a tactic because d5 is over how many how many defenders are on d5 black has four defenders on d5 but yeah. white punches the pawn through anyway because of this amazing uh point you, you provided which is that black can't take everything when the rook is trapped so just instructive to see how you punish your opponent for having their king in the center and having lack of development on the queen side because that's what Dubrov did here with that move yeah, I, I keep reminding people that one of my favorite chess books is The Attacking Manual by Jakob Agard, and he's got an entire chapter that's called Chewing on Granite. And those are positions where a move like d5, it looks like that square is controlled by four or five pieces of black, and you still play it because that is yep. just such a powerful attacking move. So yep. that is Chewing yep. on Granite. Instructive, and then we've got a fork knight emote there from International Master Eric Rosen's chat. So it does exist. Go ahead and uh, go subscribe oh! to Eric Rosen's channel. Eric, how dare! <laughs> Go subscribe to Eric's Rosen's channel if you want to use that. That's awesome. That, right, that, well. is, uh, that is unfair. Uh, but maybe he created it without knowing that I was going to have my one. So well, it's you can, okay. still, you can do other Eric ones. There's all kinds of ways to do the same types of emotes. I've learned that. I've learned that over time. I don't know how, but you know, you know we've got <laughs> creative people. Who could do that? Well, all right. So Dubrov is Dubrov is going to win. You know, a really, really nice game here. I think is White. Um, another game that's going down between the Wizard and the Movers. Oh wait, let's. Okay, Knight D7. Well, yeah, Knight takes C6 is just game over. So let's let's keep that board up on the left, but also bring up Sergey Gregorian's game versus Vinny the Pooh because this one is almost like I said. I didn't know which one to go to between the Wizards and the Movers because this one is also really crazy. When I first spied it, it was after uh, this move f6 was met by knight takes d5 on move 20. Anna, if you back up, just yeah, let again, me catch up with you. not exactly the same as far as taking advantage of your opponent's king in the center, Anna, but it is taking Ooh. advantage of your last move by black. This diagonal mm -hmm. becomes weak, and mm -hmm. you don't have to ask a grandmaster like Gregorians twice what to do. He just immediately spots the tactic knight takes d5. And the reason is that after knight takes, bishop takes, black can't take one more time because of the discovery fork. Do we have a discovery fork? Like maybe like mm -hmm. a maybe like a magnifying glass with a fork, right? I would love to see that. Yes. A discovery fork. 
Anyway, so that's the that's the tactic there that uh, Gregorian spied, and so because of that, uh, Black actually played the move rook to a6. Mm -hmm. But okay, White was just White had just stolen a pawn like a thief in the night, right? A good healthy <laughs> pawn, and and Gregorian's is winning. Yes, this is a winning position, and that should be an easy win for White. Also, it's very instructive how he played the next moves. He took on g7, then played knight e5. Textbook yep. play by Gregorians. That yep. would mean yet another point for the Wizards. And, and so then... if these two boards convert as they should, again, everybody, you've got Vlad yeah. Dubrov for the Wizards uh, really giving us some instruction with that move d5 if you missed it. Um, definitely go to chess.com and follow the games and check that one out or, or look for some instruction coming your way because that, that was a brilliant game there. Um, Gregorian's also about to win this one as white. That means what's going on with the bottom boards versus the top boards of the movers, right? So let's go look at Firehearts yeah. game. Because so far, this is looking very promising for the Wizards. They were already a, pawn, a point up in, yep. in this match and now they are about to win two more games. But, uh, okay, we've got Adiban Baskaran here trying to help the movers uh, stave off the Wizards' lead there. You can already see they've got a 3-2 lead at this time. Hmm. Baskaran is better as white in this in this game here um, against Usmanov. Um, yes, it's a pair of bishops, equal material, but the e6 pass pawn is way stronger than any other pawn on the board. It's a protected pass pawn that means that the Black King is tied down to the blockade of those yep. squares, the e7 and e8 squares he has to catch. And the pair of bishops will help this pawn, I believe. Bishop d4 is a promising move while bringing the king. Well, we just saw Dubrov uh, take down his opponent, again, brilliant fashion. And look at this last move by Gregorians. I I have to Whoa. go back there. I know I want to cover more than one game, but again, Gregorians and Dubrov are putting on a show for us. Now we have another d5 tactic, and after rook d6, hey, guess what? You can't move that pawn. It's pinned. Uh, Yeah, I can. Yeah, I can. <laughs> the the anti-pin anti emote strikes again. Oh, I love it. Yeah, this is really beautiful. The tactical elements that Gregorians has used in this game. And the position is still, of course, pretty much winning for White. And it decides of advantage. It, it has to be. Now, I'm curious if there's anyone from the movers, because we mentioned these two games, Dobrov and Gregorians doing very well about to win their games. If anyone from the movers team can somehow uh, upset the score, Adiburn. Ooh, Adiban isn't winning anymore, maybe, because it's opposite color bishops now. Yeah, what happened here? Yeah, I mean, this is this has been a brilliant round for the Wizards so far because of their top two boards, uh, Gregorians and Dubrov. Um, and now we see yeah. Boscaron still better with the extra pawn on this board, everybody, but... Okay, what's happening in Gregorian's game? I, I, sorry, I can't, I can't keep my eye off this game. This is like, now he's down a queen... <laughs> All right, I'll stop trying to go away from you, Gregorians. Okay, we we stay. Just, we I stay. mean, we're we're gonna. <laughs> well, I just want to see the finish here. We have to keep it. Sure. Because... <laughs> yeah, he's about to win. So now, because of the back rank pin, he's given up his queen temporarily because now after rook c8, he's threatening knight d7, knight f7. Uh, everything is in the air. Knight and... f7 check is coming. Yes, I mean knight f7. That is the biggest threat. After queen f5 attacking the rook, yeah, well, now still you can. Is knight f7 check. just going to be mate? Knight f7, king moves, and then okay, there's rook takes e8. There's knight or h6 knight check. Eight, six, yeah, I, uh, choosing four. choosing your flavor. Yeah. And, he just uh, takes the queen and says that okay, I'm going to give me. Okay, now we can finally go back to Fireheart's game uh, versus uh, Gamma Gamma Grama. Th shout out to uh, to our last. Last little gifted sub there. Everyone loves to get that username read on the show. But you, you fooled me once before. You would not fool me again. <laughs> um, all right. I think that Boscaron has uh, has his problems here. I, I don't know that this is going to be so easily converted. Yes, I'm curious why he thought that this would be the best way to go for the endgame. So he had a pair of bishops, and then he gave up one of the bishops 
to win the B pawn. But as you guys know, opposite color bishop M games can be really difficult to convert. Sometimes even yep. two pawns down can be can be defended because you have a bishop that controls squares in this case the light squares by the black bishop are controlled and you cannot do anything about that with your own bishop yep shout out to slide talent for the for the very very uh kind note there with the resubscription one of your favorite channels on twitch you love the channel you love the commentary you love the content we love you slide talent so thank you thank for you that. so much for your support and thanks for everyone for subscribing shout out to almost 2,900 of you watching on Valentine's Day. This is the Pro Chess League Week 6, the Eastern Division. We are covering Asian and European teams fighting for the top spot in the best and strongest online chess competition that has brought, been brought, brought to you by Twitch and Chess.com in order to create an eSports chess event, and I'm loving it. The... Uh... The, the movers are going to be feeling it after this one because Boscaron not getting this win is is uh, is really going to hurt. When when the top boards of the Wizards did their due diligence, they did their job. And again, you highlighted it really well, Anna. The point is, yes, you're up a pawn, and it's and it's a strong pass pawn on e6, right? It you're is. two moves away from a brand new baby girl on e8, but not mm -hmm. happening because you can't force the king away from a square you can't attack. And when it comes to obstacle bishop endings. Often you're a bystander to the one square you wish you could attack, right? Um, fun story. I don't know why I'm going to tell this story, but I'm going to tell this story. I once saw a young kid try to move his bishop from one color to another just to change that. Oh, just to, just to change so that. And it was actually, the reason it's funny is because it wasn't cheating. It was actually a four-year-old kid who recognized the issue on it. Like, he, he tried to dance around the king so many times, yes. eventually realized that he wasn't making progress. So he just Aww. put the math together in his head and tried to move the bishop to a light square. That is adorable. It's genius, right? I mean, a genius little cheater right there. So, <laughs> you know. Um, anyway, but yeah, this game should be a draw. Uh, I don't I don't see how... I don't see how Boscron breaks through, and neither does he. As you can tell, everybody, he's now gone from three minutes down to just about under a minute. So uh, we're not the only ones who see it as as one that kind of slipped away. Um, on the left there, you see we've got another board up. That's the round, but the Battle of the Birds, as I'm calling it, the mm -hmm. Armenia Eagles, the reigning champions there, uh, Shant Sargsyan versus Maxim Shigeev um, for the for the Moscow Phoenix. So. Um, yeah, that's the top board of the Phoenix versus board three of the Eagles. Usually you would expect the board one doing very well. And in this position, I do like I do like White, but I don't think that he's got much if he has anything because I like yep. that he's on the seventh rank, putting pressure on the C7 pawn. But at the same time, Black has managed to activate his king. It's very active on g4. The knight is really well placed on e6, protecting the pawn on c7 and also controlling important squares in the center. And also the rook is well placed on the d5. So why shall Sargisian even lose this game? Maybe he's even better. No, I mean, it's weird because white's up a, up a pawn, I guess. Um, but I, I agree with you. Those double pawns are actually really useful. Um, uh, well, they're useful for keeping the king out, but the black king is so active that it's hard to see it making progress. I just brought one of our other boards here um, on the right to the, the matchup between the Eagles' top board, that's Zavin Andreasian, mm -hmm. versus the board three of the Moscow Phoenix, Afonsiev, because the board three is, uh, is on, the, on the grind here. On, he's on the attack, yeah. and I, I, don't, I don't think that Andreasian should be able to hold this. I mean, this is 99 problems, and the second rank is one of them. <laughs> the, the white, white, white is in trouble. But an extra pawn and and all these extremely active pieces with the second rank attack, as Danny highlighted. How can how can Zavin even try to trick Black in this position? That's what I'm looking at. Because objectively speaking, I think Black has to be winning. This should be a decisive advantage. And these are moments when the stronger player usually tries to find a lost trick, yeah. some tactical element that the opponent can fall into. But where is well, it? I don't know. Um... I was going to say, there's a very clear threat. I, I'm sure it's what uh, Afonsiev is, is thinking of, but G5 is, is coming. And Okay, the reason why Black can't just take everything on G2 now is because White has this defender. So it would stand to reason that G5 should be a, a pretty strong move to get rid of that knight. Um, and G5 there we go. G5 is on the board. 
Yep. What do I do about Afanasyev it? Afanasyev is, is just uh, playing logical moves here. I think now he can save the rook if he wants anywhere on uh, anywhere on the second rank. Okay, he chooses mm -hmm. d2 over e2. The exchange sack is kind of just delaying the inevitable. I expect black to take back with the e pawn, and after the knight moves, you can even just take the c3 pawn. Um, fun, fun line. Okay, never mind, it doesn't work. Sorry, I thought mm -hmm. I had a fun mate. Queen c3, knight d2. I wanted queen g3 check. Um, oh. But, uh, okay, it actually doesn't lose, because in the end you have this weird little triangulation and you win your piece back, but I thought I had mate on the h-file. But who knows, Anafasiev might take c3 anyway. Um, no need, I guess, though. Maybe just rook e2, rook c2, and, and Andre Austin's going down. This is a, a big game right here. Don't underestimate early in the match how big a win of an FM Fide Master over Grandmaster Andre Austin could be for the Moscow Phoenix. It's huge. This upset can be crucial for the match. As you see that the score is, is really close. So far, the Eagles have scored two points and the Phoenix two. So for a tied match and having your board one with the white pieces going down against board three, a Fide Master from your opponent's team, that is really crucial. And I think that the Phoenix are doing really impressive so far against the reigning champions. Agreed what about the other boards? Because if Andresian goes down, we got to see if the Eagles can score on the rest of the boards. Yep. Well, um, we're gonna we're gonna leave Andreasian's game where it is and bring up another one that is maybe maybe gonna help the Eagles. You asked that question and maybe I can provide the answer here because uh Materiasian is uh is about to get a win for the Eagles as white. I feel like he's picking between rookie seven, rook h seven, and all kinds of other things here. Okay, or queen h six. Um woman's grandmaster, Alina Bibel. Uh Bibble is uh is falling there. Mate in two, actually. Queen h6, after the king moves, there was just queen h8, mate. And so. it's game over, so that ties the score. In case Zaven goes down, so far he still is trying to somehow trick his opponent after the exchange sacrifice. Did he move the rook away, by the way, after knight f3? I want to check back. No, on it's, that still, it's still there. Uh, Black hasn't even moved yet, but I actually brought up the game between Ana Sargisian, Sargisian, mm -hmm. I guess, Sargsyan, um, versus Semen Kanan. Here, here the Phoenix are also in good shape, but I, I don't know if it's enough. It feels like Sargsyan might have just swindled herself a draw here with queen c5 check and queen back to f2. Um, and indeed, she finds this. I'm not, I'm not sure how black uh, doesn't have a perpetual here. It looks pretty... Looks yeah, like King it should C3 be pretty good. Yeah, King is an attempt to try to escape from the perpetual check. White is an extra pawn, so he is trying to avoid that the game ends in a draw. But it's not so simple. King C4, in order to try to go King D5, King E6, and hide the king, yep. is an attempt. It's a good point, and I think uh, that that's that's kind of instructive in the sense that usually the way draws are happening here is when you're when your opponent is unwilling to do something like this so even with queens on the board in end games like this if white has any winning chances you have to kind of kind of run the king up and find shelter you know with uh, with the queen protecting the king somehow with some sort of checks um i still think that they're Seems like there should be some sort of likely perpetual but maybe i'm wrong maybe maybe the king comes to d5 as you're saying on in and actually, Black doesn't have a clear perpetual. Yes, I'm. I'm doubting whether Sargisian can manage to create a perpetual after King D5. But this is clearly the critical moment. If King D5, where shall Black give a check from the D file or from the long diagonal? Because if it's well, a check I was from thinking, D5, I was thinking D3 would hit B3, and I guess I thought it would just prevent king you know prevents queen d4 or prevents yeah, king e6 yeah she goes for it takes the pawn but the problem about queen in games is that it's not about the quantity of the pawn yep. but the quality and the yep. f plus pawn is way more important than any of black's pawns yep. so i think white is happy giving Whoa. back the pawn she just blundered queen d5 Ooh, and as king soon as queen f7 is happened completely winning for white has to be winning right the f pawns are yeah it's just over queen d5 yeah. Forces the queens off the board, and king c7 is even met by king e6. And, yes, uh, Conan is calculating the king and pawn in game, and I'm pretty sure he's going to go for it. Well, you were right. I was wrong. 
Um, the uh, I looked at the position and thought with the open king that Sargsyan would uh, that she had very good chances for a perpetual, but uh, Conan took the right approach, activated the king, and as long as he finds it here, it looks like he does. As soon as we say that, he plays it on the board, and now king e6 should be game over. Yep. Instructive stuff there. And, and again, this is a good lesson for everybody of how dangerous endgames can be if you haven't properly anticipated uh, the next endgame coming, which is, what's the next endgame? Is it a king and pawn ending? It's a rook and pawn ending, a knight endgame. But you have to always be aware of the trades that are that are possible so that you don't blunder things like that. And Okay, now black... Danny, Danny, Danny we yep. missed something huge. What happened? The player that was an exchange down and... No way! He won. How did what? How did White win that game? We gotta bring it up. Oh my gosh! What how in the world? Is this possible. Knight of three. This game is over. Black is up the exchange. Rook d three. Queen c five. And Black just allows a mating net with the queen and knight. Uh, apparently yes, and then he blundered his rook. Okay, well king d7 is already king g7 is already horrible. Rook takes f3 is 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 game over. Whoa. On on move 39, because the king can run out of perpetual check as long as you get rid of the knight. So that was the first blunder. Now e5 comes. Rook d8 just blundered queen. Oh my god, he just made a, a one move blunder. Woof, this, this is a heartbreak for the Moscow Phoenix. And this one game could actually turn the tables in the entire match. A game that should have been a victory for the Russian team. And instead, Andreas Jan swindles his way back into the game and even gets the full point. I'm glad I'm not on camera right now because you don't want to see the faces I'm making. This is <laughs> gross. And uh, wow, just horrible, horrible blunder of the week there. I mean... Just gives up. Queen takes f6, and uh, and that means we can we can turn our full attention here uh, to the game that's happening. Uh, although, wait, did that? I guess that brought that brought that round of play between the birds, the battle of the birds, kind of to a close. Um, so we're back to kind of checking on the other matches, but huge, huge stuff. And uh, Nikita Mezhkov, as we've said, is already playing his game. For board uh, board one for the horses against Ponsulea, but wow, I'm speechless. Crazy uh, me stuff. too. And this game means that the the Phoenix, instead of being up a point, they are now down a point. It's four and a half in favor of the Eagles. Yep. Wow. wow. Well, if you're just joining us, or if you've somehow only just tuned into the Pro Chess League for the first time in your life, first of all, shame on you. Second of yeah. all, give us a follow. Third of all, welcome to the big show. And we've got a lot of exciting things happening here. Uh, Mezhkovs does just take a, a game there for the horses. But while we have your attention, let's remind you of all the different portals you can follow the Pro Chess League. YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, social networking. It's a thing. It's here. Don't ask me about it. It's not going anywhere. You can also go to Live Chess. Twitter, Danny. I'm proud of your Twitter game. That's, I got a strong Twitter game. I'm never going to get on Instagram. I'm sorry. I know you want me oh. there, but it, it's not happening. Um Live Chess is where you see all the games in action. Um, and get your merch, actually. I've got a backpack sitting right here in the office if we give our first shout-out to Studio C, which is... Uh, well, let's let's give a shout-out real quick to Studio C. That's where the action is. That's where we're producing things from. And, uh, Studio C. Uh, hey, hey, are you focused over there or what? Uh, first of all, you made a common mistake. You, are, you got to flag the two earlier so that you can move faster. <laughs> <laughs> we show the Pro Chess League yeah, yeah, backpack yeah, yeah, yeah. while we're Sorry. here. Studio Z. I love when my producer's focused. That's what I love. Yeah, totally. <laughs> how's uh, How's Fabi doing back there? <laughs> I Bobby's used to play the game all the time. Don't remember though when when I last tried. The backpack is amazing. I need to get my one. I am, I'm also hoping for the rest of the merch, and you guys should definitely check out everything that you can get by the Pro Chess League. So if Please, Mubot could. Oh, Mubot is faster than I am. Mubot is already there in the chat on Twitch. You just gotta click on the link where you can purchase all these cool stuffs. I also have launched my own merch today, so for me this is a new thing that I have my favorite emote from my Twitch channel, the Anna Heart emote for Valentine's Day. It has been launched just now. That's 
pretty awesome. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna get some of that. Get get one of those. Um, it will look very good on you, Danny. I'm recommending you. the whole yeah. on a heart. The the heart heart swag. I'm all about it. Um, <laughs> we're, we're we brought our attention over here to this game between Jojua and uh, Toronto One. Don't uh, don't know who that is off the top of my head. It's actually the board four today for the horses, I believe. Um, but uh, it looks like David Jojua is gonna gonna do his job for the gentleman. No surprise, because they seem to just they seem to just show up every week and and dominate. White is much better here. Um, the C pawn is strong. You you could even just play C six here, right? And even offer the queen trade if you're white. Given that if the ladies come off the board, you've got bishop d7 at some point if you really need to to guard the c6 pawn and trap that rook. So feels like uh, Jojua should be moments away from getting getting the gentleman a two-point lead over the Estonia horses. Yes, and as Danny pointed out at the very beginning of the show, that really see gentlemen have been massive in the past few weeks. They started with the Battle Royale. They were the team that scored the most points in the Battle Royale format. And they are very convincing. They have the first place in the Eastern Division with more points than anyone in the division with an extra round added to their score. I'm still shocked by that Zavin Andreasian game. Seriously, if you just got here, everybody, you got to back up. Somebody clipped that. How, how, did, how did White come back? That is just crazy. But the Eagles have done... Uh, have had good luck in a lot of areas of the league. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Armenia Eagles right now with a four and a half lead over their bird rival from Moscow. Um, they're the reigning champions, and sometimes in in any sort of championship run in any sport, you need a little bit of luck. And that that was what we just saw there. That was crazy. Um, yes, and and luck can only come to the players that actually believe that they still have a chance. So kudos to Andresian for yep. believing in his chances. In a completely lost position. That was that was really deep. Luck can only come to people that believe <laughs> they still have a chance. That's well. You gotta be optimistic. You gotta be optimistic. That was deep. I like that. Uh, you know, I don't want to you know change the subject and get zen on you, but I appreciate that. You should you should write some of those comments down. Um, but. Thank uh, you, all right. Um, no, seriously though, it uh, it's true, and he does get full credit for keeping his head in the game because. Anyway, we should focus on the other games, but I'll stop talking about it. All right, what else? Um, what else we got here? We got the game we're covering between Jojua and uh, Toronto 1 is the furthest along, but there's also some games about to come to an end between the Wizards and the Movers. On If you mm -hmm. see one that you like, let me know. Um, sure, I'm going to scroll through their games and let you know. Ooh, the game between <laughs> Sultan Dram and Briakin. What is the king doing on F6? I'm I'm looking. Where's the uh, Where's the game you're talking about? Oh, it's let's go there. Mon Manu David it's versus Manu uh, Bri yeah. Mikhail Briakon. What is happening here? <laughs> I'm just trying to see. Well, not only is the king on F6, but black is winning. <laughs> it doesn't even matter that the king's on F6 because the white king is in more trouble. This looks like yeah. a Sveshnikov. Okay, I was gonna say this looks like a line in the Sveshnikov that is deceptively. Uh, not as good as you think is white. Um, and I looked at the opening and confirmed that because I've, I've, I've lost, I've lost some games with the white pieces in similar fashion. And I'm going to go through the opening to show kind of the critical moment where, um, so this is all theory here. And in the Sveshnikov, black is sacrificing structure. So doubled pawns and light squares for the bishop pair. That's what black is sacrificing. Uh, but in doing so, you get very aggressive. So you play early moves like f5, and then you make trades to open the position and, and try to take advantage of white's king. But this idea after knight d4 takes b5, I played positions like this myself on, let's say, on move 17, where I felt like white should just be totally good here. I mean, there's threats of queen c6 and the light squares, but it can be very deceptive that, that the dark squares with the obstacle bishops are totally safe for black. And as we can see on e4, there was a check, but the king just walked right up. King e7. Eventually, this king is going to come all the way to f6. And um, again, it's weird, but I think that black is black is just doing fantastically here. And and now now the rook is probably coming to. Oh, I was going to say rook c8, rook to the c file, and then into c2. But maybe this way just gets there with tempo. Now the rook mm -hmm. comes to c8 on the next move. 
Yeah, and the problem of White is that he's only playing with two pieces. You gotta yeah. use all your pieces, your full army, and the A1 and H age one rooks are not doing anything, unemployed stuff there. So yeah, that's mainly the reason why black should be doing very well here, even though the king is on f6, but safer than yep. the f1 king. Totally, totally safer. Well, I share uh, Manu David's pain here again. I've fallen kind of prey to just not not having enough experience in these. Sh I guess I only play Blitz and Bullet these days, so I get to give myself that. But I've I've fallen for these kind of lines where I feel like I'm just crushing on the light squares, but the king is is completely safe, and it's it's a valuable lesson of how dangerous this is when your king, as as Anna said, is on F1. You know, just creating dysfunction between the rooks. Right? That's mm. not a happy family, and. No. Uh, <laughs> And Black Especially is just going to be winning here. You gotta highlight this is about team effort, a good family, yep. good family dynamic. And uh, yeah, that's it's very bad. All right, um, let, let's quickly go back here. We got to go back to this game between uh, Jojua and Tarantula One because somehow it's become a game of mutual time pressure. Oh my God, is this really happening? How did Jojua blow this? What? I gotta okay. go back to game two. I, I, maybe King E4 just blew it. He's threatening Knight D3, but not really, because on King C3, there is no E2. I think he missed that, because the Knight hangs with check. He just missed that. As soon as he played it, I could tell that he just, like, forgot that... Uh, and now now Joshua should still be winning. He can take G4. Okay, King D4, take E3, and, and he One should One second for Black. Win. Oh, he's got a flag. <laughs> 0 0.8 oh, second. You scared me. God, don't yell at me like that. I... I'm sorry. I was, no, I was it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. And there was resignation with point two. Now I'm yelling. Okay, <laughs> wow. Uh, that was B-A-N-A-N-A-S. And I don't know how Jojua made that even as close as it was. I'm just going to back up because we left this one thinking he's the favorite. He's the GM. He's up on time. Uh, he had that extra C pawn, which I loved. I okay, so here you go. He played this move queen b six, trading queens, and then ultimately lost the B pawn. So Ooh. keeping the queens on the board or even playing C six was better, but he played Queen B six and look what happened. He ultimately lost the B pawn and the game became completely unclear. Um, but he did ultimately win, which I guess is a good sign. The bishop is better than the knight with pieces on both sides of the board. So all right. Just had to review that. For those of you who care, we're back on uh we're back on the matchup between the Stormbringers and the Dynamite. I'm going to check those games too. Let me open the, the rest of the games. Um, and in terms of the, the match situation, you can see all the scores below next to the analysis board if you haven't realized. The Dynamites versus the Stormbringers is a one-point lead for the Russian team. And, uh, wow, three points lead already for the Wizards over the Mumbai Movers. That is huge. The Mumbai Movers have been doing very well so far. They are at the third place in the standings. And the Wizards, they got to win today's match to have some chance, to have a hope for qualifying yep. for the playoffs. Well, they're, they're fighting, right? They're on their way to do it. Shout out to Diamond Member in the Chess TV chat, Nick Kane, who says he did care about that analysis that we just did. That Aww. You care. Thank you. You, Thank you. Thanks for uh, caring. Wisconsin Mike, these polos are not for sale. They are only giveaway. Go ahead, flash it, Anna. Show the polo. Yay. Show the logo. There we go. My favorite color, by the yeah. way. If if anyone could tell. Yeah. The uh, no, these polos are not for sale. They're only for the commentators and for people we um kind of give them to. Partly because they're like you know, they're not the cheapest gear we've ever ordered. They're really nice, right? Ooh. I mean, they're nice, they're like nice. like My legit. My favorite polo. Yeah. And, and it's actually, true that I love this polo. Like, uh, it's the perfect fit, quality material. So it's a really cool one. Yeah. All right. Well, Grigori is uh, he's having a good day. I I haven't followed his Pro Chess League 2019 season as closely as maybe I should have, and I I don't I don't know if this would be one of his better days. But it feels like he's really played well. Now he has Rook takes e5. Um, in this position, and, and it seems to me like he should just be about to win. Uh, I, I don't see why Rook takes e5 isn't just lights out. The bishop is attacked, and if it moves everybody, the g6 pawn falls. So, um, Yes, true story. Will that help the Indians? Um, I'm looking at the rest of the boards. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so Ooh. where are we at in this matchup since we're here? Yeah, Restor I was going to look at the Grover Ivlev game for a moment because it's queen versus two rooks. That's always exciting to see whether the queen is stronger or the two rooks. Oh, yeah, let's totally go there. That's, uh, that's exciting. It feels like normally the rook should be better in this kind of open board, especially with the king, but because the white king has no shelter and the b-pawn is so strong, it's just maybe that's just not the case. In fact... Is Queen BH check just gonna just gonna get a second a second queen on the next move? Yeah. Now, because now you're guarding the mate, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, just show everybody the reason why queening was not an option is because of check check and Bob's your uncle on G7. Um, <laughs> so. Although I wonder if that position with black promoting, and yeah. White would have to give up a rook on B1, then rook G7. And d7, can he promote his pawn as well? Because he's got the d and f pawns very much advanced. Oh, wait. You're, if... Okay, you're suggesting d6, I see. Uh, yes. Yes, sorry. I, I saw that we were analyzing that position. So yep. white is going to lose one of his rooks, but then he's got these two really strong pass pawns. It, it's such a unique position. Mm -hmm. Black also has two pass pawns, but they are one square behind on the fourth rank. Yep. No, that's, I don't know what this that's, uh, is. that's a really good point. It's a very dangerous line for black to consider. It makes you think that maybe, no, but that might be too slow. I was thinking maybe you could play C3, but then white could actually sack everything, I think, on, on G8, and actually white wins because of queening with check on D8. So so instead, Ivlev plays queen E8, king of 5 and... Uh, hmm. And what's the next move? There's got to be something with that king on f5 on that on that queening square diagonal. You just there has to be some kind of combination here. I mean, actually, can you just get a queen now? No, because then rook g7 and you take rook g7 intermediate move. So the rook was going to be hanging on g6, but check first on g7 and then he takes the queen. So what if queen takes g6? Rook Ooh, takes and then beautiful. queen. Beautiful. <gasps> I love that. Very very well spotted, Danny. Queen takes g6 is on the board and then he Oh, and he finds what? it. Perfect timing for black. Okay, so now and the, now the main thing is that d7 I think should fail to e3 with check. E3 check. Super important that this is a check because he's one square away. Yep. So he's, he's gaining a tempo for his pass pawn, and then he should stop d8 promotion with his queen. So the king moves somewhere, let's say king to f4, and black should deal with the d8 threat. Queen to d3, queen to b6. Yep. Those are the possibilities. Yeah, and if this queen finds itself on any square that stops the stops the queen for whatever, where, however that square is, whether it's on the d file or on mm -hmm. some diagonal, then. Then, then white will really be in trouble because, as you said, now the e pawn is running up the board. Extra tempo makes a big difference. Um, Diamond member Nick Haynes says, if you're wearing chess clothes and you're good at chess or a chess commentator, it looks good. But otherwise, you might not look. I mean, I think chess is cool, even if you're not playing chess. You can wear chess. Totally. No, chess. Yeah. Chess is fashionable. Go and get some merch. There's the link by Muba. Get something that you like for Valentine's Day. I think it's the perfect gift, honestly. Uh, yep. And buy or girlfriend would appreciate a chess polo i'm i think i'm 100 percent sure of that all right um because my wife has like four of them and she she wears them every day oh <laughs> best wife in the world yeah no they're really they're really good to get but you should definitely get some yeah it it yeah. was partially of course a a joke by Danny and me, but you gotta get the merch. You gotta yep. get some of these cool items because they are cool, whether for yourself or as a gift. Um, all right, well let's let's keep this one on the left up with Sahaj Grover and Ivled, but bring up the one between Opari and Grigori and Indian Lad because this one is also about to be wild. And Grigori has been moments away from converting this one, I think, for a while. But now that he's got about ten seconds left. Okay, okay. Right as I come here, I guess commentators curse for Indian Lad, who held on Ooh. for a while. <laughs> but classic uh -oh. Danny bringing the jinx. Totally jinxed. What so. happened? The, uh... Alright, Bishop of 4 check is, is going to be made on H4. Maybe we'll see checkmate, so let's not go anywhere if he plays yeah, King H5. Oh, he didn't. I thought he might made himself. Uh, almost. 
That's too bad. So, well, white is still moments away from mate if black doesn't trade rooks because there's king h3 and g4. So we'll see if it happens. Okay, or king f3 and g4. Yeah, I'm hoping out for a mate. Six. Mate into the threat. I'm holding out for a hero. <gasps> What's gonna? Can he? Can he play? Bishop f4, and if g takes g4, rook h6, and he's on the board! Oh, Yay! he finds it! Bishop f4! Oh! And there's g4 coming! I love it! It's so beautiful! Let's see it. Let's, uh, very, very up. nice. Nice find, Anna. Nice yeah. find. By the way, on the left side, Ivlev is still winning and should be for for the, um, the Stormbringers who have unfortunately brought the thunder to Grover today because he has not been his best day. You're welcome. No, not You're welcome. his best. He's a strong grandmaster, but today he has been under yeah. control. Um, but okay, Bishop of Four, very, very nice. Uh, hmm. Waiting well, to see. Bishop of Four, G Four is the threat whether Black okay. wants to take or not, and Oparin wins. Uh, Indian lad resigns in this position. It was such a beautiful finish. Bishop to yep. f4. And again, just to show everybody the reason why is that if you take, we have g4 check. And, uh, okay, there's a number of ways this one's over, but winning the rook is, is good enough. And uh, something like g4, the king moves. And now if the rook moves, again, we're back to checkmate ideas. Bob's your uncle on h6 there. Greg was saying in the chat that you gotta explain the Bob the Uncle reference. You Bob's your well. First of all, everybody has an Uncle Bob. Just so you know, you don't know that you do, but you have an <laughs> Uncle Bob somewhere in your family lineage. I promise you that. Oh, um, we have him <laughs> on the screen. Our shout out to our producer Aaron. Yeah, there is he, Uncle well, Bob. Uncle Bob is um, Bob's your uncle is a phrase that. Wiki, it. wiki it, Greg. I don't know. Google, where did Bob's your uncle come from? It's it. It kind of just means like, like Pop goes the weasel. It's like saying that, like, and Pop goes the weasel, and then <laughs> Bob's your uncle. Aww. Like that. That's kind of like it. Kind of means like game over. It's it's uh that's okay. that's what it means. But you know, I love Shout it. Shout out to Aaron. I'm using my Aaron emote in the chat, and let's get some hype to Peter Poggers. We've got also OMG Danny. That's one of my favorite emotes here by Chess.com. If you subscribe to the channel, that's when you get access to all these cool emotes. I'm going to use the OMG Danny together with Robert has his favorite emote. That is the bagel I wish I could eat right now. That's right. Well, we'll get some bagels later. But uh, all right. Well, okay, let's let's go check out uh, Gama Grama's game versus Vinny the Pooh. Uh, on the left side, everybody, we can still see the final game in progress between the Dynamite and the Stormbringers in this round. Um, a uh, a matchup where the Stormbringers are currently in the lead by two, but uh, but could still be anyone's matchup, especially if if uh, Grover can somehow hold this one. I, I don't think he's going to. I think he's I think he's actually moments away from resigning. But okay, um, on the left, we'll keep it there so we can catch the end. Let's look at Usmanov versus Mital. Because that's an exciting one uh, between the Wizards and the Movers over here on the right. Um, yeah, Mital should be better, actually. The Movers need it. The Movers need a big round, Anna. They need a big round. They're down by three points. Uh, Vlad Dubrov and Gregorians have been on fire today. So um, we're going to give this matchup some love, see if the Movers can pull a comeback here. Yeah, they definitely need a miracle in the last round. Because it, it, so could, far... it could start, I mean, things could start going their way if they're board one. Adivan Boscaron can get things going, and he's taking on Sergei Gregorians here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to check that game, too. Give me a second. Adivan performed extremely well so far in the Proces League, especially last week when he went four out of four. He beat Hari Krishna as well, who is a higher rated uh, teammate of his. Both of them are on the Olympic team of India, good friends. And he managed to beat Hari Krishna. And with that victory, the Mumbai Movers won the India Derby. Yep. And that's how they are in the third place at the moment. But today they are really struggling against the Wizards. The Wizards being on the sixth place due to the three Ooh. penalty points they collected for changing their lineup last minute. 
Yeah, and so they need they need to win this match, justify that that last minute lineup change. Somehow yeah. Grover is keeping it a little bit tricky over there against Ivlev just because of constant threats of queening the deep on and and other other nonsense. But uh, but all right, Ivlev only has 20 seconds now to seven seconds there for Grover. Um, on the right side, Boscaron feels like he's he's in trouble against Gregorians right now. But let's. Uh, Let's see if Ivlev can figure out the right way. I, I don't know why checking and then getting a queen isn't isn't good enough, even if you have to give your, your other queen back on D8. So, um, isn't he just repeating the position? I'm afraid that it's going to yeah, be 3 it should points. almost be a draw. This is really getting into dangerous territory. Let's. I'm going to bring back the analysis board so that we can go over that in a second and show exactly how Black should have won, because right now I have no idea what Ivlev is doing. Oh, now um, he can promote. He has stopped the deep one. Now he can promote. He's finally stopped the deep one. I, I, okay, it, it it took a long time. I wonder if uh, Grover could have hit the draw button. Did the position repeat three times? Then it's automatic, but thanks to chess.com, who That's, is the well, arbiter if, also. If it, if it repeated three times and you press the draw button, just like a FIDE draw claim, it'll it'll be automatic. So let's see. I mean... Yeah. Um, it was it was close there, at least in my head it was. So we had this position here once with the queen on h3 and the king on h6. Can have I a queen on g4, king on g6. Maybe he, he was missing just one more position with the queen on e4 and king on g6. So this is two times for this one at least, queen on g. Now two times for this one, queen on h3, king on h6, king g6, queen d3. Okay, may, I guess it wasn't. You're right. It was two. It was two times for both the queen on g4 and the queen on h3, but not a draw. Yeah, that was that was just walking on the on a rope. But he managed to eventually place the queen on d3 and then promote in and not give a threefold repetition situation. All right, well, let's go back to analyzing this one here between Usmanov and Mital. That's Gama Grama and Vinnie the Pooh. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I think I think Mattel's in pretty good shape here. He's up, he's almost up two pawns, but only one, I guess, um, since I've never been very good at math. Um, almost oh, doesn't almost doesn't count, that, Danny. Danny. What? <laughs> don't tell me about that. Every time I stream with John Urschel, I feel so. Oh, I know. Like it's like, <laughs> and sometimes it's like he just does it just to like make me not feel smart. Like John just mentions, you know, some sort of algorithm. I'm like, yeah, John, I know, you're a mathematician, <laughs> and I'm not. No, toward me, he's the opposite. He's trying to make me believe I can add up two numbers, but the situation is that, no, I can't. That's the case. <laughs> That's the case. All right, well, uh, what just happened? I thought Black was doing fine. Well, I just turned away, and White wins. I'm just, I can't yeah, predict I anything today. I also just switched to another board. The D-pawn is, is, is uh, getting aggressive here. You got Dirty Daryl over here on the D-file running up the board. Now White could even play like simple move like G3 just to unpin it, and D7 is a threat. Um, you know what I bet he's looking at right now? Is Bishop takes G6 a move? Ooh, fancy. No, can't be. <laughs> yeah, can't be. Maybe an idea, but I don't think it's necessary. Rookie 6, though. There you go. I was looking Ooh. at the tactics there. Rookie 6 does the trick. Now Bishop takes G6 as resigns. I knew it was. I knew there was something, and the reason is that if you take g6, you can't take the rook because it's mate in two. And again, he finds it. All right, well, beautiful. I could, I could, I could smell it. I could smell it. I just couldn't put it together. Danny smells blood. Ooh. All right, well, we'll see if we get checkmate here and another chance, another chance to uh, to make sure people know exactly why Uncle Bob is an official part of the show. So. All right, Bishop takes oh. g6. Usmanov is trying to figure it out. I think that, I think. <laughs> I'm glad that Rec has found his one and only Uncle Bob too. And uh... to Google. <laughs> <laughs> this is a oh, forever Uncle emote. Bob. That has to be an emote. Robert Hess is Uncle Bob. The theories have been confirmed. This is uh, too good. Uncle Bobbert. Uncle, uh, Uncle definitely, definitely the next emote on chess.com should uh, be. That Uncle is Bobbert. the next emote on chess.com, and you shall use it, everybody. This is this is where it's at now, because honestly, I started calling Robert Bob years ago, much to the chagrin of his mother. And he hates it. He and hates it's never, it. I, it's the one thing that his mom 
And I say a lot of things I shouldn't say, as you know, Anna. It's the one thing his mom has said. Will you tell Danny to stop calling you Bob? <laughs> well, and there we go, Robert, Robert in <laughs> in creation. Uncle Robert, I'm loving it. I'm sure that Robert, when he wakes up to broadcast the next division with Alexandra, he's going to be so pleased to know about well, it. Uh, he's going to love Valentine's it. Let's, Day let's, present for Robert. Let's keep a two-board setup here and bring up Boscaron's game with Gregorians on the right. We got Fireheart, uh, Fireheart rocking himself. Uh, but unfortunately not enough because it looks like right as I say that it ended Gregorians played King G3 and I guess the threat was to swing the rook and and again Bob's your uncle over here on G1 so <laughs> this is uh this is mate and bake and Bob helped um Yay. all right so that one's over um we've uh, <laughs> uh we're having a good time here all right what's going on with Karanki's game versus new bar 1198 we've got it up on the left board and the right here, there's some crazy tactics I think about to happen. Bishop takes f2, but it's not going to be enough. Looks like White's about to convert with a baby girl on b8. Um, <laughs> okay, what about this game between uh, Materiasian versus Shigeyev? The eagles um, and the birds, eagles and the and the phoenix are back at it. Yeah, um, I was just looking at the score because the wizards have already. Uh, collected eight points eight and a half is the mark to yep. team victory so half a point more and the wizards are beating the third place moon by movers it would be a miracle if they can come back having only three points at the moment it's eight to three i think that could be the biggest comeback if the indian team will manage but it's highly unlikely unfortunately for them yeah well especially because uh in this situation it looks like it's about to move move to nine points uh Sela Verstoff is is just completely winning here, hmm. and indeed yeah. takes it takes it home. So uh, the it's Wizards over, are yeah. now up nine to three, headed into the last round of play, and have already clinched uh, the matchup versus the Movers. So that um, is huge, and they can get more game points. So the system is that the team victory counts, but then the game points are added. So of course the Wizards will try their best in the last round to yep. get even more points for the standings. And so we've got two games up here in the Battle of the Birds. No, we have not seen a Birds opening. Saw that question earlier in the Twitch chat. Sorry, didn't shout you out, but uh, good question. No, no Birds openings here. Uh, Alina Bivol versus Sargsyan there. Um, looks like uh, Bivol is is in a tough spot there. Um, Materiasyan is... Unfortunately for the for the Eagles, also down. So this is kind of a, a coin flip here. Shigeyev looks like he should win his black, and Sargisyan should also win his white. Mm, yeah, I'm just checking these games too, opening up the match between the Phoenix and the I feel like we're about Eagles. to get something fancy over there on... Uh, I mean, I think Bishop... No, okay, Bishop takes d5. Doesn't quite work because it's... White can recapture with check. But all right, Bishop b8 now threatens queen e5. And the he rook on a7. Bishop b8, which is a beautiful idea. Yep. It frees the diagonal for the queen, so next move can be queen e5. And mate on h2. On the right side, this move, uh, bishop g2 did not win a piece because uh, the knight is already hanging. Oh, okay, well, now we're just going to get a big trade where black will be up a couple pawns in the rook ending. Should be good enough for Shigeyev to win. Mm-hmm. In terms of the match, match situation between the two birds, you can see that the Eagles are a point up, and that's mainly thanks to Zavin Andresia on the top board of the Eagles, yep. escaping from a lost position, swindling his way out to first maybe a, a draw, but potentially a perpetual check, and then his opponent even blundering a rook and the full point. So you see on has, uh, has won there on the uh, on the his game, so the Eagles get another point, but as we've said, Materiasian probably not in the in the uh in the best spot here. Under ten seconds and Shigeyev is is kind of just picking. I mean, do I want to keep the bishop on the board, which of course black can do. Bishop back to D five. Totally good here, right? Uh yeah. stop any tactics, threaten the A two pawn, the G five knight is hanging. 
But he's probably also saying, do I even need more pieces on the board? If I've got enough pawns, why not just go win? Something like rook takes g5, king takes, and then c4. Mm -hmm. And the point is, white, white can give a check and try to go take an a7 pawn, but then the black rook will come to c5 and rush the c-pawn up the board, and uh, and it's over. So I think that I think that Shigeev is just kind of choosing choosing the simplest path to victory. Yes, and that will mean one more point for the Phoenix. They definitely need it because so far it's a two-point deficit. Yep. Now you mentioned I'm Zavin Andreasian, um, yeah. and he looks like he's about to bounce back on it because hmm. he shouldn't have won his last game, but here he is what seems to be completely dominating moments away from winning. The rook on the g-file, is queen to c3 a threat, or am I crazy? Oh, I am oh, crazy. Queen like takes a four check. Move. What? Yeah, I was thinking of queen c3 as well. White is a pawn up, and certainly this g5 pin uh, is a tactical element in the position. Yeah, but queen c3 would fail the queen takes a four check, removing the rook. Yeah. But okay. Counter tactics. Counter tactics by deflecting the rook from the g-file and winning the queen. Andreasen just thinking of what to do, though. I mean, knight to g5 seems strong. He plays rook h4, and I guess I guess queen f6 can be met by just knight h5 and just eliminate that dark square bishop. He simply plays rook to h4 to attack the queen. I wonder what's the follow-up of the queen f6. It looks so suspicious for black. Well, that's what I was saying. Maybe knight h5. Yeah, I like knight h5 to get rid of the g7 bishop. Also, there's going to be a trade on the fourth rank where the rooks yeah. will be off of the board. And it, even if it's just an end game, well, in an end game, maybe black has some chances because of the pair of bishops. But I think it's the combination that white is an extra pawn, has got really active pieces, and the pawn structure of black is still really vulnerable. So it's one pawn down for black, but all his pawns, if you look at the black pawns, every single pawn is an isolated pawn. They're not helping each other, and that will cause these pawns to be extremely weak in an end game too. Yep. Well, as we said, uh, the Eagles have a lead right now, and Andreasian getting this win will increase on it. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, likely they are headed to a six and a half, four and a half lead. Um, Bart Simpson in the Chess TV chat wonders if Robert Hess has been watching this show. That's a good question. You'll get a chance to ask him because he'll be hosting right after all of this is done uh, with Women's Video Master Alexander Botez. So definitely stick around for that if some of you by chance are just getting here. We have a full day ahead of Pro Chess League action. So uh, don't go anywhere. All right, now White can and take E4 and then play Queen takes D6. Pro Chess League. A seven-hour broadcast of Pro Chess League. This is a seven great hour. seven hour hours straight. Day present. Yes. And then uh, Hikaru Nakamura will be playing his match. So actually it's a full day action here. Full on day Twitter. of chess. Well, let's uh, let's go check on the only board here between the Eagles and the Phoenix that we haven't checked on yet this round, and that is Anna Sar Sargisian's game versus uh, Afanasiev. Because mm -hmm. here she she actually looks like she's maybe about to get her first uh, her first point on the board. She's got this past a pawn on, and I and I uh, I like it. I think I think it can yeah. push. Let's do it. Right, a four. Let's go. It's totally push and baby moment, so we gotta push and baby. we gotta play the cues, the Yasu Sairavan, Chesbra action, a4, a3, a2. Who's gonna stop that pawn? Oh, I, I like this move too, because actually, king e1, you can play knight b2. You don't have to make a trade, right? And mm. that leaves everybody all pinned up. Um, not to be confused with all shook up. <laughs> Great song. I know, I love it too. If King Ivan, as Danny said, that pin will be really annoying and knight c4 threat is about to win a piece, plus the a pawn is still a factor. So this should be a win for Anna Sargisian. And that's one point for me for my fantasy team. Well, now she's got a piece hanging on d2, but. Um... The idea of why should be rook d7. So bishop yeah. takes d2, rook d7. There's a problem with black defending these two pieces on the d file. But you'd like to think there's some way for the A pawn to just get going now. And the question is, which piece do you want to keep, the bishop or the knight? My instincts say keep the bishop um, because because it you know it's guarding the, the queening square of the A pawn um, and potentially very useful for stopping white's past pawns, right? We usually want the bishop in these types of endgames. So bishop c3 is the move that 
my first thought is, but there may be some concrete ideas against that. Ooh, 93. Hmm. Oh, fancy. She's going for a rook end game with the yeah. multiple trade on e3 and taking the g3 pawn. Which is... But rook end games are tricky. It's going to be one pawn up for black. But the but as you've said before, right, in these endgames, like a queen and pawn ending, it's not who what pawns you have, it's who queens first. I wonder if knight h4 was... Hmm... I'm I'm not so sure that uh, that this knight e3 was very good, and I just look at a line like this because I think that if I if I move the king and 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 the f pawn somehow becomes faster than the a pawn, that may have been Anafasiev's chance to to flip yeah. things around. Look Although... what happened instead. White played knight to h4 to keep the pieces on the board, and now I don't even know who is better anymore because suddenly yeah. White is pushing his post pawns as well. I, uh, what again, is the knight that... doing on f1? It's well, and the knight on f1 is trapped. I mean, rook. Why not rook f2? I don't know why White's not playing rook f2. Um, maybe he just thought he won't have time to take the knight because of the b and a pawns. But this is definitely yeah. But now, now black's down. pawns are faster. Wow, what a what a crazy finish to this game. This is this is uh, gangster chess here. Just pawn push him, baby. <laughs> totally, pawns no time on the clock. Thirteen seconds left for both players. The B and A pawns are marching forward. So is the E pawn, but the rook can be sacrificed for the E pawn and yeah, the B and, and A pawns. Okay, no you one can take the knight and then give check on C4. But if Black has a queen, this should be over. Yeah, I think Anna Sergisian has done it, but this was totally crazy. And you can see the evaluation bar jumping oh, up and down. Oh, look at that trick, down. though. Now she's okay. She has this idea of rook, or he has this idea of rook B check. Unfortunately, it's not enough actually because the black king can come to c7 and it stops the mm -hmm. pawn. Okay, so it just it was just a fancy way to end the game, but uh, not enough for 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 white to get anything. Wow, uh, this has been quite a game with its yeah. ups and downs. Really exciting chess, but Anna Sergisian eventually wins, and that is an extra point for the Eagles in the Battle of the Birds, as Danny labeled it. I love it. Yeah, and uh, wow, a a a big a big game there. Sargis Sargisian getting that win helps the Eagles get that much closer to a match victory. They are now a point away from eight and a half, which mm -hmm. which is enough to to win the match. Um, you see, we're moving back onto the gentlemen versus the horses. That was the last match to start of the day, so they are the furthest. Uh, sorry, the the farthest behind. Um, okay, we've got. We've got the game between Elvis and Jababa there. Let's also bring up the game between Meshkovs and Jojua. Um, because sure. here, it's a it's a good contrast and comparison. On, on the left-hand side, you've got board one of the gentlemen versus board two, I believe. Mm -hmm. Board two, yes, of the horses. Yeah. Versus, on the right side, you've got Meshkovs, who's board one for the horses, versus board two of the gentlemen. Indeed. And we have already seen uh, some... Really inspiring quotes by both board ones. Mashkovs mentioning that he used to rap a lot in high school and Jabawa preparing for the games. Danny, remind our viewers what's his way of preparing for a pro chess league. Yeah. I'm with you, Ed Vetter. It happens, buddy. Ed Vetter saying after 22,000 tactics puzzles. <laughs> first of all, that's a lot of time spending on tactics. So um, you're making good choices. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I also still suck at chess, so, you know, welcome. Welcome to the club. Um, all right, shout out to everybody that's with us. Thank you for being here. We are, uh, moving toward the latter half of the day of the Eastern Division. Right after this, of course, we will have the Central Division games coming up, so don't go anywhere if you just got here. Grab a snack and, and buckle in. Strap yourself into a chair with, like, a seatbelt so that you can't go anywhere. It's, it's just safety first. <laughs> And just tell your wife and girlfriends about it, or boyfriends and husbands, because I'm expecting to have more and more female viewers too. I would love to see the chess community being way more balanced, because chess is cool and more girls should play chess. That's true. Agreed. Um, all right, well, on the left side in the game between Elvis and Jababa, um, should just be a draw. Uh, it's a rook ending that... I don't think offers very good winning chances for White, despite being up a pawn, partly because those pawns are broken, and a lot of rook endings are drawn. Plus, Jobaba is a pretty strong grandmaster, knows how to knows how to defend these. On the right side, it's much more unclear. Uh, Mezhkovs, I think, has some chances uh, for an advantage for the horses, and they need it. 
Uh, they are trailing the gentleman right now. Um, mm -hmm. Your thoughts, Anna, on a possible plan there for Meshkovs? I'm looking at ideas of kind of a, a, sl a slow play to the queen side. Yeah, I like knight d2 because my thought was play queen b4, knight b3, um, queen b4, knight b3, a4, a5, and then open up the a file slowly but surely. If I bring the knight to b3, Anna, I'm not even I'm not even gonna take the rook. I'm not I'm not even doing it for that. I'm I'm doing it to play queen b4, a4, and a5. So what do, what do you think about this idea? I love your idea, and I think it's a good point that maybe white doesn't even want to capture the rook if black doesn't move it away because knight takes c5, d takes c5 would lead to a very close position where it's gonna be tough to see how can white. Uh, breaks right. through. So instead of capturing the rook, if black leaves the rook on c5, I like Danny's idea of queen b4, a4, a5. And the good point about uh, this pawn push is that it's a white who's going to decide when to open the position, the a file in this sense. You can first place your rook on a2, then bring the other rook to the a5 2 and uh -huh. threaten a6. Yeah, I like it. And, uh, ooh. Is that okay? I, I was sure Black planned to leave the rook there and sack the exchange because moving it also allows the d6 pawn to be taken. And yeah, I'm, I'm sitting here like, what am I missing? And Meshkovs just grabs the pawn. So, uh, um, Yes, I'm puzzled why he wanted to give up the maybe, d4. I guess from a practical perspective, he kind of knows he's worse. And so giving up the pawn, maybe he gets e4 in on it and tries to open up the bishop. Mm -hmm. Kind of a an outside chance of just you know, throwing caution to the wind and trying to open up the position for black. Now you've got both rooks coordinated and you've got the bishop here. And I think there's something to be said for just the practical point of view of knowing you're worse, but trying to create something crazy and dynamic rather than letting your opponent just kind of beat you down. I agree with you that this must be his reasoning. I was expecting E4 to go with the flow, take the initiative and try to create yep. compensation for the material loss. Um, I guess he evaluated the other position, the exchange sacrifice, as a, a position where Black is dying slowly. And here he has at least some activity. Let's let's bring one of the boards over here to this game between Schwarzman IP and Tarantula One because we're about to see a time, a time edge there, and uh, that's Pontesulia versus Tarantula One, who's been under time pressure a lot. And he's down to two seconds on it. Look at this game, like. Black Ooh, is so okay. Maybe Black draw. can't win. I thought mm -hmm. Black has this a pawn, and maybe he's in good shape. But probably this should be a draw. But anything could happen over here. We might we might have uh, some craziness. By the way, we have had e4 on the board there by Georgiou. So two very exciting yeah. games on the screen right now. Yeah, and the Black in the other game can simply flag two seconds on the clock. The knight has just been captured. G takes f2, and there's only one pawn left. Rook and knight versus rook is a theoretical draw, yep. but it doesn't mean that the players need to shake hands immediately, and White can try because he's got time. The opponent doesn't. Yeah, I think uh, the one of the issues is maybe White will lose all winning chances if he has to part ways with the knight. A2, knight b3. Oh, he is knight c2. Okay, knight b3 was met by rook b1. My bad. So, all right. So white does find a way to win that pawn, and now Pontesulia will will try to win this one um, with uh, with black under so much time pressure. And it but has I... happened to top grandmasters that they yep. lose this position, even though it has to be rather easy, easy, <laughs> easy in a sense that theoretically it's easy, but in practice it's not easy at all, especially not with four seconds on the clock to yep. defend it with. Uh, simply moving the rook around. There can be forks all the time. The knight is a very dangerous piece. And you see right now white's oh. threatening h5. Yeah, only, only 1.9 seconds. On the right side, too, you've also got Jojua, who, as we said, has been worse, and, and we were critical of giving up the d6 pawn, and he should lose. So none of that is being uh, changed in our view that Mezhkov should get that win for the horses. But, but he also has just made a totally weird position. Right now, there is a threat on the board. Okay, he just stopped the threat of rook takes b3 and queen a1 mate, which I'll mm -hmm. just show everybody exactly why white had to trade queens. Making any other move would have allowed something like this, and then Bob's your uncle on a1. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but okay, Mezhkov should still win. But again, I just give you a credit just for recognizing the situation, and, and maybe I'm... Maybe I'm saying this, and maybe it'll pay off, because the, the more Meshkovs gets under time pressure, this is what the gentlemen have done all year, and 
could you really say that White's advantage is any bigger than it was before on it? I don't think so. I mean, Jojua has, has really gotten himself back in this, and now we have mutual time pressure. Yeah, it's not a clear position at all, even if... Even if the evaluation bar shows advantage for white, with all these pins are all over the board and no time on the clock, I think it can be any result. All yeah, I, and, and, and again, from a practical point of view, given that white let this one slip, and now his king might also not be the safest thing over there on B1. I, uh, and, you know, don't forget, Harry's, Harry's a wizard, right? You're a <laughs> wizard, Harry. <laughs> You're a wizard. I'm going to use the Gotham chess emote. I love that emote of Levy. Yeah, we got to do that, right? Get, the, yeah. get your Levy Rosman emotes, emote on. Wingardium Levy Rosman. Um, Shout out to Levy, who's doing the highlight shows for the Pro Chess League. Yesterday was a stream day, and you got to learn a lot from Gotham chess. Okay, well, if, if Black if Black wants to, you could even take on B5 and take C6. Yeah, he does it. I, I, I kind of like that idea from Jojiba's perspective. Remember, even a draw with black against the top board for the horses is a strategic win for the gentleman mm -hmm. at this point in the match, right on. I mean, they're up they're up on the scoreboard and again, board 2 with black taking on board 1 with white. This is a successful successful result if black can draw this, especially given where the game was. Oh, let's give one second a shout out to our producer, Aaron. I've just seen what he has done. Spot on, spot on. He's spot not on. only playing and, those uh, sorts of board games, but he's actually making fantastic production for the Pro Chess League. The fastest emotes in the West, they say. <laughs> um, okay. Well, uh, nowhere else to go. I've been I've been creeping and looking at the other games. I mean, there you know, we're going to check back in with the matchup that is furthest along here in just a moment between the Delhi Dynamite uh and the Volga Stormbringers, but um right now these are these are the two games closest to finishing, so we'll keep it right here. Keep it locked. Yeah, as for the movers, unfortunately, they have lost the match already, but it does matter how many game points they yep. collect. So, Adiban's team has still something to play for. Okay, now uh, with the other game between the gentlemen and the horses, likely likely going to be a draw. I mean, at this point, it looks like Black is defending. Um, we'll we'll move the right side back to Mikhail Briakin's game versus Saj Grover because this is the furthest game, the game that's furthest along. And again, Grover has just not had a great day uh, no, no, for no. the Dynamite. Yeah, he's a very strong grandmaster, but today he's been clearly underperforming. And, uh, well, this is the most promising position he got, I think, so far in all his games. It's an extra pawn for black, if I can count. Is that? No. It's just doubled pawns. I'm very no, bad at double pawns, but... I'm very bad at maths. But, uh, no, it, it looked that way, but again, because the double pawns are just isolated and not looking very healthy. But um, I think Baryakin's big advantage is just over here on the queen side. Figure out how to get this B pawn going and you will have a victory. Um, okay, knight to d3 is played, and the bishop would love to stay on this diagonal to do something nasty to the white king, but likely cannot. Um, likely needs to stay on this diagonal and guard the threat of b5. So yeah, that's the best way to guard it, is just blockade it straight up. Yeah, it's okay. going to take some patience to convert this into a full point by black, but so far, at least he has a better position. Yep. And... I think I think he can do it, especially if we look at the time management. Sahai Grover over five minutes, and his opponent is going really down on the clock. It's only a minute and a half left for Biakin. Ponsilea not given up, um, not given up over there on the idea of swindling his opponent under time pressure. And this is a good lesson for everybody watching: why you want to learn these end games, why you want to practice them, because. You know, knowing that it's a draw and then being able to do it with no time on the clock are two very different things. And it looks like Black is going to do that. Hopefully I'm not jinxing him. But, you know, he looks like he's he's on pace to drawing. And um, you can practice these endgames. Really, uh, a lot of chess websites have these tools. But on ours, you can go to chess.com slash, I think, I think the drills actually have this endgame. Mm -hmm. um, and if you ever want to practice what what different uh, types of end games are that you might get in a real game practicing them against a computer is a very good way to master them 
because yeah i'm recommending the same to you guys and also you you need to know how to give mate with two bishops a bishop and a knight practice it before you get it in an actual game so it would be really a shame if you can't win those games with two pieces up yep okay well um let's see just checking on some of the other positions here seeing if we got anything exciting that we're missing um, again, I still don't think that one is going to be anything but a draw and that uh, Black is, is defending. But uh, we'll keep it up. And what's going on in this one between Indian Lad and Fralianov? Fralianov's up a piece. So the Stormbringers, who are right now up in the match, are looking to clinch it. I mean, Fralianov, if he gets this one here as Black, will do just that, bringing the Stormbringers to nine points total there. Yeah, eight and a half would already be a team victory for the Stormbringers. So today what we see is that the Russian teams are really upsetting the Indian teams. The Dynamites and the Movers have been performing better in the first five weeks of the Proches League. But today it's upset day and the Russians are really bringing on their A game. Yep. Yeah, the, uh, the Russian versus India battle definitely going to the Soviets right now. Is it okay to, to say Soviets? I think it is, right? <laughs> you got to ask the Russians if they are cool about it. Yeah. The Soviet school of chess. I'm, I think that's, that's good to say because that's really respected. And uh, so uh, many uh, champions come from the Soviet school of chess. Uncle Sasha is forever a Soviet, not a Russian. So that's why. Um, <laughs> Denis Boros, Grandmaster Blue Wizard, hanging on the Chess TV chat, said that he thought Ponsulea would win. But no, indeed. Black did hold the draw, and uh, mm -hmm. kudos there doing so, living off the increment, quite literally, right? About four yeah. seconds for the last 50 moves. So it shows you why, again, the Rook and Knight is very different than Rook and Bishop. If it was Rook and Bishop versus Rook and four seconds for your opponent, you'd probably win that game. Rook and Knight mm -hmm. is just so much harder to, to swindle and trick. Yes, um, indeed. All right, well, we're on this matchup that is moments away from being clinched by the Stormbringers. If, bringer, bringers. Uh, I mentioned that if uh, Fralianov can, can win his black up a piece, but Oparin Grigori is doing what he's supposed to do against ABG Gupta right now. Uh, black should be winning this rook ending in a number of different ways. Yes, because the G pass pawn is way more advanced than white's pass pawn. So you see it's equal material, but it matters how far you have pushed your pawns so far. Yep. And it's back to move, so he can just simply play G3. Okay, it's well, he just board. pushes the pawn, no problem with that. Now yeah. G2 is over, and again, the king... Oh, he doesn't do it, but the king on D3 being cut off is the biggest problem, too. So Black can, Black can just march the pawns up the board, choose his path to victory... And uh, Gupta will resign, and indeed he does so. Um, okay, so with that game over, the Stormbringers it, have officially yeah. moved to nine points. Team victory for the Stormbringers, but every single point matters. So the Indian teams still need yep. to fight and try to score more points, even if they're, the match is already over, in the sense that it's a team victory for both Russian teams already. I'm going to check the other position here, looking at Indian Led versus Froyanov. Indian Led being Grandmaster Narayanan. Queen C6. Pinning the F3 knight, putting pressure on the D7 knight. This G6 knight is doing a very good job controlling the F8 square, and the queen is controlling the F6 square. Those yep. were the two spots where fight could have created some counterplay, but without those checks, it's just a piece up for black. I was going to say, and now I think F4 is coming because there's threats of knight H4 check and the F3 pawn falling in a lot of positions. So, um, okay, currently the queen on D8 spies that square, so that that's useful for white, but should be... Uh, should be a difficult one for White to hold, and the Stormbringers should increase on their on their match victory, I think, with this game. Um, it's huge. It's, it's not just beating one of the top teams of the Pro Chess League, but both Russian teams are, are pulling right. out a, a, a really impressive victory because it's one thing to win the match with eight and a half points or nine, but they have won the match and they are still collecting points. They are adding yep. to their, their score. Well, let's... Uh... Let's move back over to this matchup here um, between Vinny the Pooh and Karanki. 
to me one of the more exciting games going here. Mm -hmm. uh, the the king is in the center. Black has a rook for two pieces. But I don't see any concrete. There. I first looked at this position in spite it and felt like, ooh, black is better. Black should be winning here. And the more I look at it, the more I'm thinking that uh, that white is actually just fine. In fact, okay, knight e3. I was wondering, could white have just played the move queen to h3, just flipped over to the h file? Maybe, maybe uh, Mitel missed that, but. I'm hmm. about to catch up with you. I lost uh, this game, and now I'm here as well. And yeah, it's, it's really confusing when you see the king in the middle of the board. It's two pieces, two minor pieces for white versus the rook. Um, in terms of the pawns, you guys know that I'm very bad at calculating, counting how many are there on the board. Mm -hmm. is, that, <laughs> is that one pawn? So it's a rook and a pawn for the two minor pieces. Yep. But you guys, correct me in the chat if that was bad math. No, it, it seems to be the right math. And Ooh, wait a rook second. C3 he heads into the, the rook ending, but that shouldn't be... Ooh. Now the rook comes to c1, and I don't really think that black has an advantage despite being up a pawn, because white grabs the only open file very quickly. I actually, I think that was a mistake I by uh, Seleverstov. Maybe he felt like he was worse. Um, but as yes, uh, he went for this rook end game where Danny uh, very well explained that black is a pawn up, but white is really active. Yep. Rook's is going to come and the white king is more active than the black king so it yep. should be enough compensation no i was just about to highlight that point next i was drawing king e3 and as as he played it because as you said on it there you made that comment earlier in a different end game but again a lot of these end games it's not so much the pawn count it's activity it's the threats of who's going to be able to get a queen it's it's these sort of things you have to take into account and white's much more active king now potentially going all the way to g5 mm -hmm. i mean Yes, black is up a pawn, and, you know, that is material, but owning this open file, having the much more active king, is usually um, usually more important, and Divoresky's School of Chess often talked about that, the active, just especially because of the dynamics of the chessboard, the geometry of how important open files are in, in single rook endings, the more active rook and the more active king is often worth a pawn. Um, and he plays king g5, I really like white's chances here. Are we really yes, worried about I, the e pawn pushing? At least, at least equal with such active pieces. But it's black who has to be careful. And now the e pawn is about to drop. Rook f5 to pick up the d5 pawn yeah. is one of the main options for black. Uh, kudos, by the way, to Protoss League Commissioner Greg Shahadi for getting some pizza sauce on his monitor. I think that's an achievement. Well done, Commissioner. I'm getting well, the, uh, hungry and hungrier by by Greg and the rest of the crew talking about lunch. I'm it's, very. It's definitely lunch. definitely always good to spray pizza sauce on your monitor. I mean that's that's good. Um, all right, King G4 again. White is the only one who can be better, as you said, on it because the E4 pawn will fall and probably the F4 pawn, and there's going to be threats of rookie seven check. So okay, best play in a lot of these rook endings should still lead to a draw, but I was just surprised by Black going for that because I think you. You had no winning chances, really, with that decision mm -hmm. if you're uh, Selaverst off. So, okay. Now white can play king takes f4 um, and should. So yeah, in the get... meantime, the Stormbringers have finished their match against the Delhi Dynamites. It's 10 and a half, 5 and a half. That's a massive score. Yep. Uh, 14 to 2 was the record in the Proteus League, but we have only seen that once. <laughs> once in a lifetime it happens, but 10 and a half is a really impressive score. Normally, a match is won with eight and a half or nine points. Well, and uh, the this game, despite, the, again, the criticism of Selaverstov going for this ending, that he really has no winning chances, but probably, probably still going to be a draw. So let's move to two games in this matchup between the Wizards and the Movers that aren't that clear, starting with Vlad Dubro versus Adivan Boscaron, because this is, this is a crazy one. And the other game we could bring up is the game between Sergio Chess 83 versus Wizard 456 because Gregorians mm -hmm. and uh, D Diptalian Ghosh, Mr. Ghosh, um, also totally unclear. So I look at these two games, Anna, which uh, give us your opinion on, on one that you, you see first. Oof, I'm looking at the Dobrov game at the moment, trying to evaluate whether this King on E2 is a good or bad piece. It might be well placed there sometimes you can get away with it and i think this could be one of those scenarios because i don't see how black can open the e-file 
or do something on the f2 square is the the queen is of course threatening from g2 but you need more than one piece to right. attack the opponent's king and the white pieces on the d5 are very well placed all the heavy pieces are active plus the c5 bishop that is blocking the c5 from the c8 rook that's a great point and now with the rook coming to d7 there's threats of queen to d5 where the bishop on c5 is not just blocking the c file as you said but also guarding the f8 square and making yeah. it hard to guard this f7 pawn so Look out for this threat of queen d5 and queen takes f7. The wizards have, have just been good today. Yeah, uh, Dobrov is impressive. Adiban, who scored four out of four last week, he is not doing very well. I think this could be 50% for the board one of the movers yep. if he loses this game. And over there on the left side, Gregorians with an attack. Batman and Robin at it again. The queen and the knight, of course, uh, the most the most dynamic attacking duo you can have in a lot of cases, and I think queen f4, queen h4 are both pretty obvious moves here for Gregorians. Um, yeah, he goes with queen f4. Um, Gregorians has been really impressive in yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, he's been good today. This game too is promising for white. I agree with you that the queen knight combo is excellent in attack. What can black do about the f6 hanging pawn? He plays bishop to e7. And if knight takes f6, he wants to play rook f8, I believe. Now rook c1. Where shall the black queen go? Rook to c1. The rook's coming to c7. Gregorians is uh, on the hunt. The king hunt. hunt. The Has Grove. he won game so far? I just feel like we have we have always been looking at Gregorians winning and winning, um, but I'm not sure if is that three out of three that he has scored so far. If someone can please verify it in the chat, it, you guys know that I'm I'm really bad at adding up numbers. And Dobrov, I think two is on. <sighs> okay, three now. Three. That, whoa, that was a weird transition there from Gregorians giving up the attack for for this potential Ooh. end game. But again, time pressure obviously has a lot to do with that. He's down to 10 seconds on the clock. Okay, Dubrov, uh, Dubrov did what he what we thought he was going to do here for a while and just takes down Adivan Voskaron. So, um, it's amazing that Dubrov that's... beating the, the, one of the top players of and... India, not just of the Mumbai Movers, but he is one of the top players of the entire country that India is, and there's huge... Yeah. Huge, huge chess culture for India and so many strong players and chess yep. prodigy. Well, we knew from his quote that Valentine's Day is one of Dubrov's favorite days. <laughs> but now we know it's also one of his favorite days for chess and uh, not, not for other reasons. So, um, do, you, do you want to bring up his player card or just mention? I the just, quote? I'm just, I'm still shocked. I mean, I, <laughs> um, I mean, you know, I, I, there's not much more I can say right now without going down a rabbit hole that I shouldn't go down, but I just... <laughs> um, chess is love, and Dobrov has lots of love. Yeah, for, lots of love to chess. give, and uh, and he's good. also bringing, bringing lots of love for the Wizards today, so good for him. We'll <laughs> see if his buddy Gregorians can get it done over there as well, but I think, I think Gregorians kind of let this one go. I'm going to back up the analysis board because... The main thing is that back in this situation where you've got the queen and knight doing work against the king, I did not expect to have the end game you now see over here on the on the left. So mm -hmm. um, he played knight takes f6, which seems right, but then but that forced the queen trade. So yeah. um, was there something better? Oh, you know what there was, possibly. In the Gregorian's game, yeah, let me check too, because it felt like White uh, was r about to convert it into a... Oh, decide. okay, he wins it anyway. All right, anyway. so Gregorian's converts anyway. I guess I thought that there was a much more clear oh, path to victory. Oh, was... 96 fork was blundered by Gosh. Yeah. Painful. Just... That's a painful wow. finish. Wow, Bishop to C5 just blunders it. And... Okay, this was going to be tricky for Black to hold, um, just because the Rook and Knight are so dangerous when you've got an open king. You know, it wasn't, you know, there were all kinds of threats. Knight, uh, you know, even if the bishop moved to a safe square, there's things like knight h5 check and then g4. And you, I don't know, you can get in trouble in situations like this with the king against the rook and a knight. But, but yeah, the blunder, the blunder didn't help. Um, oh, it's 12 and a half points already for the wizards. 
Yep. That's massive against one of the top teams of the of the Eastern Division. The Mumbai Movers were third place before this round. Yeah, really, really not their best day. And and now full attention is coming back here. I was just about to get to the game between uh, Materiasian and Conan, but Conan has already resigned. Materiasian wins and helps the Eagles increase on their already clinched match victory. So the mm -hmm. only the only match that still has any potential. Uh, uncertainty is this one between the gentlemen and the horses. So let's go to the game between Bador Jababa and Meshkov, since that is that is board one on board one action here. That's uh, Lexi Sexy versus first second. We'll try to analyze this one a little bit. Um, sure, and I agree with David Proust in the chat who is here with our shout out to David Proust, also a commentator of the Pro Chess League, and he has excellent videos. PCA also stands for Pro Chess Lessons, so do check out the YouTube channel where you can learn from all these games of the Pro Chess League in more detail. So yep. David analyzes every single week the best games from the Pro Chess League, and he's saying that who would have thought that the gentleman would have the smallest blowout of the day? Well, I was going to say, but it's not over yet. David, they're they're just starting their last round of play, and all four games are going. So, good point. Obviously, we've talked about how good the gentlemen have been all year, but uh, but we'll see. I think at this point, the horses are clearly in must-win territory, and I don't know that Meshkovs is going to do it against Jababa. This looks like a pretty good position for White. Um, okay, what what's what's our dynamic? What are we instructing on? You've got weak E three pawn for White, but also kind of a weak d5 pawn for black and the d file here. Um, note that black was not looking to do anything on e3 last move, for those of you wondering, because probably a number of things, but bishop takes f6 and knight takes d5 as a four-key mm -hmm. mode. Um, yeah. So now now what can Jababa do? There's things like queen a4 and then just solidify your coordination on the d file against the hanging pawns. There's things like knight f4 to consider. Um, when you have two weak pawns in the center like this without any other protection, those are called hanging pawns. And usually what you need to justify that weakness is a lot of open counterplay. You need pressure on the open lines, open open E and B file. And here black doesn't have that, which is why I like Jababa's position. I agree with you, and I'm thinking whether he can go for immediate action with bishop f6 and take on d5. But instead of being greedy, he plays rook to c2 and this rook maneuver is really instructive. Rook yeah. c2 and then rook d2. He's not moving the queen away because he wants the rook to be the first piece to be in contact with black species. So yep. instead of queen to rook d1, he's playing rook c2, rook d2. Yep. Shout out to gold member, member Steffi94. She says her fantasy team is doing well. This good week. job. Good, good job. You. I'm not doing well at all. Danny, do you have a team for this week? I didn't fill out the bracket this week. Oh. I got distracted, you know? I'm like, so much basketball coaching. So much I basketball can... coaching. I seriously, they are draining my life. Can I just say that real quick? Because none of them are watching this show. Can I just like <laughs> hate on my kids a little bit on live air? Like that's cool, right? We know that you love your kids. Oh, Dan is an gosh, amazing boss and amazing dad. I can confirm from all his tweets. All I'm, the I'm so I get into tired right now from them. <laughs> um, ooh, D four's played. What's going on here? Um. Ooh. Rook D2 anyway, but what's is we got a sack town? Can we go to sack town? Thank you. Is that the plan? D takes C3 and giving up the queen? I wanna go to D I wanna go to sack town. Okay, let's see. We can analyze it, it on our board. Takes. Takes. I mean it's probably just terrible. I mean it, it likely is. I was just visualizing things like this and thinking, yeah, that looks fun. Like the rook comes to D2 and Okay, you know. Yes, again. it would be fun. I'm not sure they want to go there. Yeah, okay, no good. <laughs> that was not Meshkov's plan. <laughs> no D5. And Benjamin is offering you his kids if you want to try different ones. Shout out to our moderators for doing an amazing job as usual. And to the Twitch community and Chess TV, we do appreciate that you're spending your Valentine's Day with us. Yep. Knight d5 is a nice move, actually. I think I think the idea on it is if he takes e7, he'll take back with the c knight, and now he's mm -hmm. he's he's established two things with the knight on d5, right? He's unpinned the pawn, so it's not pinned to the queen, and he's threatening the fork. And if you mm -hmm. take on d5, it doesn't really fix the problem, right? The knight on e3 is still a huge issue for Jababa to deal with. So, um, kind yeah. of a kind of a, an instructive little. You know, we highlighted that the way you justify these weak pawns is by being aggressive, right? You have to get counterplay yeah. to deal with your, you know, the yeah. hanging pawns we were just talking about. 
So maybe this Rook C2 plan, even though it was instructive, maybe was maybe it was a little slow in hindsight or something because because it looks like Black is getting the counterplay that you would want. Yeah, you must be right that even though I was impressed with this maneuver, it wasn't the moment because Black realized he had a chance to break through in the center, d4 with these tactical elements in the air. Now, the bishop was captured on h4. That was the whole point of the line and yep. e4. Making sure that White has is this nice outpost for his knight on d5, but the d4 pawn is alive and it's more yep. than alive. It's a protected passed pawn. Yep. And, and now the knight on on e5 maybe coming into c4. So okay, I think I think it's still very unclear. I guess we were just we just felt like possibly white was the one who was you know really going to have the the clear path to playing for two results better. But now now I think it's much more unclear. Um, yeah. Now if I had to pick, I would I think pick black in this position. It's still a mess, but I really like to have a protected passport, and the knight on e5 is convincing. Well, the uh, there's been no games ended in this round. So again, if you're you know we're, we're talking about the gentlemen, they've been a dominant team all season, and they are indeed up seven and a half, four and a half on the horses. You can see that's the last matchup still going, but they're it's not over yet. So so we've got this board one up. Let's go check on the opposite and let's go to the board four game between Volkavi and Tarantula one, which is mm -hmm. uh, Nika Volkov who has been been one of the biggest stories. But right now, um, not necessarily in a great position as Black. I actually really like... I, okay, he's just sacked the exchange right as we went there. He took mm -hmm. E3. If he, I was going to say, I really like the seventh rake on it because I was going to say yeah. Black is in trouble. If he trades on D4, White would take with the bishop, and G7 is hanging. And maybe that's what Volkov saw, so he took on E3, but now he's losing the rook on C6. Yeah, I'm not so convinced that this could work. He can take the pawn on F2 with a check and then activate his bishop. That's what he's doing, bishop h4. Um, if he can get the knight to e3 or g3, that's almost mate or then, mate or then promotion. There you go, right? Then Bob's but... your uncle, as they would say. Um, he's very far from that square. So I, I'm not buying this, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm, with, yeah, I'm not buying it either. And we've seen Volkov kind of swindle his way to a victory. Again, part of where the gentlemen have been so good is is not just in their the quality of their chess, but the practical decision-making. And I, I, I remember last week Volkov being in a similar scenario where he ultimately won a game he didn't he didn't really deserve to win because of a decision like this. White only has four minutes. White should be better, but but now you got to deal with this crazy F2 pawn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not so simple. Maybe practically it was actually a good decision then to give up the exchange because, uh, as you said, White had already so much pressure because of the second rank and active pieces. So even though it shocked us that he was about to give up, that he was about to sacrifice material, maybe this was a good practical decision. And White doesn't have much time. It's three and a half minutes. Yep. Nika Volkov, almost nine minutes. We could see an upset in a sense that he's surviving from a worse position. Yep. All right, well, let, let's keep this board four up between Nika Volkov and Tarantula one, but then bring up a game we haven't looked at between Jojka 007 and Malev 212. That, of course, is Jojua versus Jan Elvist. This is a wild one. Kings on G2, a lot of pawns action. I don't know. What do you think, Anna? Let me switch to that board. I was focusing on the Volkov game. I'm going to catch up with you in a second uh, yeah i have ooh, crazy fancy fancy king position uh, i'm trying to evaluate once again this is always the question is that is that a secure king position and white is going for the attack so white attack will be stronger and the black king will get into trouble even though yep. the white king is more exposed uh, so far i would say yes because there are no attacking pieces of black on the king side so even yep. though white has pushed g4 and f4 f5 now f6 beautiful a queen f4 queen h6 would be an idea but the bishop can still go back to f8 so it's not mate at the moment not mate but yet but it's promising. it's an idea to keep your eye on right elindauer mm -hmm. asked about our board on the left how does how does white deal with the threat that black had of knight f4 knight h5 and knight g3 but then i think that uh, toronto one just answered that with rook d5 which to dual purpose there Eric, he's both uh, both threatening mate on h5 right now and and stopping your plan. So 
Um, yeah, I mean, I think White should be able to get that one, but you're right, it's 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 tricky and dangerous, and as we said, Volkov has made a practical decision. Um, okay, well... So the gentlemen need only one point to win this match. Uh, they yep. are on seven and a half at the moment against the horses. It would be an incredible, a miracle comeback if the horses managed to tie the match. Um, because only a draw on one of the boards, and it's eight points already for the gentlemen and one point out of four games that seems to be easy to get if you are the top team in the division and have more points than anyone else in the pro chess league yep h6 interesting so white was apparently threatening something enough to uh to get black to to be nervous um okay the idea of h6 everybody right now of course the bishop cannot take because of a pin emote but um but you may regret that, right? Pawns can't go back. And uh, now I'm looking at queen h4, um, okay, or queen f4. Both of them, I think, kind of force bishop takes e3. And now, how's black dealing with the h6 pawn? I assume it's going to be king h7. But this makes makes me a little nervous. Okay, Jan Elvis knows how, to, knows how to use his pawns to defend. One of the ideas here, everybody, let me just highlight, even though I'm nervous about it, the reason this is an idea is because if white plays for a pawn storm, whenever you have two pawns next to each other, you've got this sort of kind of anchor defense and uh, Windows 10 bouncing around on me there. Um, the idea is that if, if white ever pushes the G pawn, you push H5. And if white ever pushes the H pawn, you push G5. And so you create create a scenario where you can react to any sort of lever and keep the king side closed. So that's what Elvis is trying to do on an instructed and on an instructive level, if that helps, but I still feel like this is very dangerous for Black. I agree with you. So far, he's surviving, but G5 is on the board. Oh, what Dan explained, would expect H5, but oh, Rook A, D8, going I, for a counterplay on the D5. I think H5 was going to be met by Bishop E2, and he was going to go to Sacktown over there on H5. Ah, uh, okay. He was so, afraid of that. Instead, he wants to create counterplay by taking the open file, very logical yep. play by Elvis. So if white takes on d8, rook takes d8, rook d2 is a threat. Classic, yeah. Danny, I thought I was holding alt. Uh, go to go to twitter.com slash Daniel Wrench and see the pinned the pinned tweet there at the top of my Twitter profile. Constantly self-deprecating. That's what I'm here for all week. Don't forget to tip your waitress. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, I I do I do somehow. I, I I got fat fingers, Anna. What do you want me to tell you? They're fat. I, I you know they're they're. Uh, I press buttons I'm not supposed to press. Story of my life. And you gotta get the different keyboard the, with more yeah. space between the keys if if it exists. So they should design it for you. Yep. All right. Well, we'll keep that one on the left again. That's the board four matchup because it's it's been an exciting one with that exchange sack, and we may analyze it soon. But on the right, we're back to the board one matchup: Jabava versus Meshkovs. Um, because this has gotten really weird. Where where I I still want to like Meshkovs, Anna. I want to like the D pawn. You know, I want to like the bishop, but mm -hmm. it's Jabava playing white. There's a there's a king under fire. Like I just give him so much credit that I'm about to go to you know just sack sack mate here for white. Yeah, that's what we expect from a player like Jabava being so uh, creative in every single game that he plays and of course he's famous for being one of the best attacking players but maybe the position doesn't allow it i'm looking at the f5 yep. square being very well under control so f a pawn push to f5 will be met by knight takes f5 and if knight g5 as it was played queen f5 to keep the king to, to keep the queen on the king side or he doesn't need to what would you play here danny uh yeah, I mean, I guess because I was worried that there may be something with e6 if you didn't. So I think keeping the queen there is, is going to make it harder for white to to justify weirdness. Knight goes back to e4. Again, you got to watch out for things like e6. Of course, knight e4 also threatens knight d6. Hashtag fork emote. Mm -hmm. Knight fork, for those of you who subscribe to Eric Rosen's channel. Bishop takes e5, though. What? That's a pin emote. Just... Yes, yes, he just blundered it. Yeah, totally. The pawn was... The he just go, was did Jabala just lose that pawn? I don't. I don't even know. I mean, I. This is Jabala can take a four. Pieces. He's really good at tactics, but apparently he blundered that the pawn on e5 was hanging because of the f1 yep. unprotected rook. Well, don't go anywhere, everyone. Is as as unlikely as it seems. Maybe David Pruis was right when he said, not only not maybe not a blowout for the gentleman, but maybe 
Maybe they won't even win. I mean, this is... Every one of these games could go either way. The other game... Oh, as we go there, Jan Elvis wins right as I click on the board. A resignation Ooh. for Jojua, who just... What happened when we left this? Let's go see, because we thought maybe White's attack was going. I was even critical of Elvis' approach to play h6 and keep the position closed. Yeah. I was wrong. Queen h4, h5. Knight d4, queen f2. What happened? Knight f3. Okay. Knights be creeping. Rook e3. Takes d1 and just wins the g5. It's like Jojua's overextended kingside just completely fell apart, and then he blunders rook g3. Wow. That's massive. That's a point for the horses, and they badly yeah. need it. it. This could still be an upset. The gentleman only needed yeah, one it's point. Not, it's not over. Oof. Wow. This is yeah, not so over. All right, so the the, uh, the horses get a little closer. Again, we expect Toronto one, which is a big part of why we're saying it's not over, because usually Volkov is kind of in the driver's seat against any board four he faces, but... If Volkov falls, which he is much worse over there on the left, that brings yeah. the horses another game closer. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at this game between Mezhkovs and Lexi Sexy here, and I and I think Mezhkovs is doing okay. Um, the point here is, if White takes the knight on, if, sorry, if White takes the the rook on c8 with the knight. Well, I think I think there's a number of things, but one of the one of the simplest ideas on it is just to trade the queens, take the knight, mm -hmm. and you're threatening bishop takes b2 and then c3, and the pawns are just running. Wow, that is really pretty. So such I think a power what, in these connected pass pawns. Yeah, I think that's what Jabava's thinking about here because Mezhkov's only has 20 seconds, and Jabava's going to try to come up with the trickiest swindle he can. Um. So he's not going to take the rook then, but what else can he play here? The queen trade is also not something that he's interested in with a pawn Whoa, down. No, it's not a pawn down. What? It looks like a pawn down. I'm so bad at this. The d3 pawn is clearly a very strong pass pawn, but it's not an extra pawn. It's just simply a very strong. But let, let's go to the bat cave here and actually analyze this game between Toronto 1 and Volkov, because he just played the move knight takes g2, and I'm, uh, I'm like, uh, what? You can't do this. Knight takes g2, king takes. You just wait. Can you? Ooh. Should should he have not have taken the knight on g2? Yeah. Okay. Knight takes g2. Now now black can take e7, and Volkov's getting a queen on f1. Yeah, totally. Bishop takes e7. He will have to go back to f1 with the king, or play rook d1 to prevent f1 promotion. Ah, rook d1's the key. Because then you win the G pawn, I think. I, my If you take E7 and King F1, then I think G3. Mm -hmm. And I think the threat of G2 is really irritating. So I think you're right. Mm -hmm. On I think of takes, I think you can play Rook D1. The Bishop will find safety, and then White can win the G4 pawn. And Toronto 1 is probably still better. Although, again, give Volkov credit for making this a mess. Yeah, K Kirill Chukov in here, the Freedom Master from the Estonia Horses. Um, almost uh, got tricked by Nika Volkov. Uh, impressive. Okay, well, let's keep this one up again and go back to Lexi Sexy versus Mezhkov's. Mm -hmm. uh, bring that one back up because now Mezhkov's down to six seconds, although still better. Um, it's getting harder, harder to not imagine some kind of blunder when you're down under 10 seconds on the clock. Yeah, six seconds versus three minutes. So it's not even a bullet game, but... You are the only one that doesn't have time. B3, rook a8, he's going to take a3 and defend the d3 pawn. That's his idea. He's got the c4 pawn falling. Then he can play rook c2. Also look out for knight f5 for black. But suddenly, like, white can play c5 because rook takes c5 not, steps into knight e6 fork. I think that uh, Jababa is doing very well here. Now, yeah. he keeps the extra pawn. He can activate his rooks, rook f3, attack the d3 pawn. Yeah, all the pawns are going to fall, and Jabava's going to be up a pawn in the end. Three on two on the king side. D for c. Here it comes. Wow. Just well, that... turning the tables in this game where he was in an inferior position after the middle game. Look at this move, h4, emphasizing keeping the king side kind of tied down, mm -hmm. overwinning the c pawn, which... 
okay, I mean, in a principle, on a principled level, it's instructive, and, and you're thinking about your opponent's next plan, but if white just keeps the c-pawn... Oh, wait, rook takes c5 wasn't even possible because of knight e4 check. Duh. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, it wasn't even... Yeah, r rook takes c5 wasn't even possible because of the fork on e4. My bad. So, yeah, Jababa should win Two this one. Two seconds left, and Nikita Damashkov's... Uh... Is about to flag each and every time his clock is running, and the yep. position is getting more and more difficult. Isn't he about to lose material now? It's looking so suspicious. And Volkov is also making it a total mess over there. The one game we haven't even looked at, I'm going to pop over to is, and the reason is because Berg is is on his way to winning against Ponsuleya, which again mm. is partly why we've had a storyline that those horses are in it. But I guess we should show it. White is up a piece and running the A-pawn. I've had that one kind of in my eye, and what just happened over there? Volkov just blundered a, the bishop? What? Ooh. All right, back to that game. Here is uh. me. Okay, so it's all going to come down to whether Lexi Sexy can get this one, because Volkov is about to lose for sure. The, yes, uh, and Pantelaya is also losing. It's all on Jabala whether their team wins or loses this match against the horses. Yep. Yeah, I mean, again, this is been a, it was a seven and a half to four and a half lead heading in, heading into this last round of play. But uh, the horses have not let the gentleman run away from it. There you have it. Volkov officially loses, which means we we are down to just two games. We've got Ponsuleya with an trying extra, to hold against Berg, but, but he's just... Berg with an extra piece against Ponsuleya. So it should ah, be. Ah, there it is. There it is. The fork. The final Ooh. four occurred around the world, just to Ouch. show everybody on the analysis board. Mezhkov's oh. blunders with King to D3, which we kind of saw coming given that he was under time pressure. Knight E5 check is a fork emote gone wild. Fork, -rated. fork emote Takes in the chat, guys. Fork knight. Fork knight. And Getting with that, there. with that, Ponsuleya just resigns because at that point it was almost irrelevant, right? Because uh, now his team had finally clinched it. And we are, we are in the books. Ponsuleya, he falls despite the nice-looking pantsuit. Incredible! The the horses were about to produce one of the biggest miracles in the Pro Chess League, coming back from a match that was almost decided before the last round. The gentleman only needed one point to win, but they almost didn't make it. Jobaba was also in a worse position, and all the rest of the team. Epic. Yep. Well, Jobaba finishes off a great day, though. Um, and he helps the gentlemen, although not their most dominant performance of the season. They did get a victory, which means if we bring back up the standings here to show everybody uh, what uh, what we'll be ending with, we now can see that the full results of the Eastern Division are in the books. The Dynamite fell to the Stormbringers. That was that was really, I think, maybe the most lopsided. Well, okay, no, I mean the most lopsided country on country was that Russia between the Wizards. And the Stormbringers really took it to uh, to the country of India today. Yeah, totally. And it's a massive score. It's not just a team Victor, but uh, 12 and a half to score 12 and a half points yep. against one of the top teams of the, your division. That is the Mumbai Movers. Yep. Really impressive performance by the Moscow Wizards, as well as the Volga Stormbringers beating the other Indian team, the Delhi Dynamite. Armenia Eagles convincingly keeping their second place right behind the Tbilisi gentlemen who were a little, a little bit off in the last round, but overall they were dominating the match against the horses. Yep. Well, okay. Um, with that, we... Uh... We want to remind you of why you shouldn't go anywhere. Uh, in just a moment, we have Robert Hess and Alexander Botez, who will be taking over the call as the Central gets underway. Um, he's uh, sporting a new hairdo and a new <laughs> emote. Mr. Mr. I'm Robert Hess it. is... I'm loving it. And also, <laughs> I've seen so many of you guys requesting more streams <laughs> by Danny Rams. So if you want to follow Danny on his channel and tell him to stream more often, do hover your mouse over. I think now it's Alexandra's face. Earlier it was Danny's face. But if you click on the screen with your mouse, you have a link to Danny's channel and the Pro Chess League channel. Make sure to follow their Twitch channels and yeah chess today we are missing chess today's danny i know i'm missing it too <laughs> well we've uh we've got a lot more pro chess league action ahead um and uh 
We uh, also just want to remind everybody of where they can follow us around around the league when we're not live before we turn things over. You can go to youtube.com slash pro chess league. Instructive material that we don't always have time to break down in these matches because the action's happening so fast. International Master David Pru is doing a great job and look for more content there to come for years to come. Of course, uh, twitch.tv slash pro chess league. Give us a follow over there. Uh, original content and I'm I'm on the verge on a you don't even know this yet of announcing we're gonna have we're gonna have uh, some big things going on this summer at the twitch.tv slash pro chess league channel it's not Ooh. going to end when the season ends so I'll tell you wow. that um, and that's something that I even don't know about this is the yeah. first thing that you mentioned this I'm really curious you guys should make sure to check out all the social media and the YouTube channel and it's going to be now Robert Hess with his new hairdo and Alexandra Botas taking over to guide you right. through the central division of the Pro Chess League. Thank you so much for tuning in and shout out to our moderators for their amazing work as usual. I think I think that's good. Let's give one shout out to our producer real quick before we sign Yay, off. Studio Mara. C. Studio C. We got, the, we got the green screen. We got Fabi hanging out. Georg Meyer just assassinating people. Yay. MBL. <laughs> Always watching, Poggers. always judging. Oh, Peter Poggers, this is Poggers Studio C. You guys should definitely check out the Studio C channel to see behind the scenes and and to know whether Danny actually dressed up only for, with the polo or he's wearing actual pants too. That's an interesting question. You never know. You never know. That's the you only angle you can tell. <laughs> so, all right. Well, um, we're gonna we're gonna hand things over. Anna, this has been this has been great. I'll see you next week and. Uh, can't wait for the central that's about to kick off, and so Indeed. don't go anywhere, everybody. Have a nice day, everyone. Enjoy the day with Robert and Alexandra, and lots of chess action here on Twitch.